You will stay where you are. You will not move. We have some preparations to make. And then... Then something very odd happened. Half of Dr. Marlowe came alive. His right side first. His right eye lighting up while his left eye stayed dead. His right hand twitching while his left hand remained stiff. Half of him came alive. Only half. Theater 5 presents Terror from Beyond. What's that? Did someone... Remember! Try and remember! Sir, you will not remember. Do you understand? When we are gone, it will be gone. As if it had never happened. And you will not remember. But you've got to remember, John! You've got to! The whole future of mankind, of life on Earth, depends on it! You've got to! I sat up in bed, listening. The surf was pounding at the foot of the cliff. But that was all. Had I really heard something or just imagined it? I didn't know. All I knew was I was in a cold sweat... But that wasn't surprising after what had happened. The deaths and... Deaths? But they'd been accidents. Maybe if I went back over it from the beginning... That's right, John! Start back at the beginning! Then maybe you'll remember! And you've got to! You've got to! When was the beginning? When I arrived at the base, I suppose went to the administration building for that first briefing session with Dr. Marlowe and Roy. Oh, it's good to see you again, John. It's good to see you, Doctor. Great to have you aboard, John. Did you mind our doing this, pulling strings to have you assigned up here for a while? Are you kidding? You said it was something interesting. We think it is. As interesting and important as any space work that's being done anywhere today. I know. We'll be putting a man on the moon in a few years, but... If we're to go on from there, one of the things we should know is what we're likely to find. In other words, whether there's intelligent life anywhere in the solar system. Mm -hmm. That's why I hated leaving the old project. You haven't. <laughs> this is still part of the old project. Uh, remember what our problem was on Van Gogh? Of course. A radio telescope can pick up any message from out there that might be beamed at us, but it's sometimes very difficult to tell precisely where it's coming from. Exactly. Well, we're using a technique here that'll take care of that. A light beam, rather than radio waves. You mean a laser? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, we discussed that. We've already hit the moon with a beam no bigger than a pencil, but suppose you do establish a contact, how do you get your feedback, your response? Well, we believe we've solved that problem, uh, theoretically at least. But we needed an electronics specialist to work on it with us. That's why we requested you. When do we start? Right away. Uh, by the way, you're sharing a cottage with Roy. Now, why don't you go on down there with him? Drop your luggage, we'll get to work. The work. I remember that. Weeks of it. Finally, the big night. The night of our first test. It was clear and cool. The ocean still, not thundering, but whispering at the base of the cliffs as if it were waiting. All the stars sharp and clear like signposts on the road to the infinite. Dr. Marlowe at the computer, Roy and I at the center console. T minus two. Check. By the way, Doctor, I meant to ask you before, what made you pick Damus as our first target? Well, it was a few weeks after you left the project. We got a message from there. No. Well, there was some question about it, John. First, as to whether it was really was a coherent message, and second, as to whether it was from Damus. The British got a fix on it, too. And it was on the hydrogen wavelength, the one we always said anyone out there would use. A 
that's true. And even though we never got another one, I thought it was worth exploring further. Of course. But that's fantastic. Yes, it's an exciting prospect. But it's also a rather frightening one. Why do you say that? We're reaching out, John. We're getting close to the secret of matter. The origin of life. The mystery of the universe. Sometimes I become a little afraid. Afraid that we may stumble onto something that's too much, too big for us. T minus 10 seconds. Check. Power on. Give me a reading, John. Vector 9. 18.2 and steady. Time. How long to contact? Three minutes, 28 seconds. We sat there tensely, watching our instruments and the clock. Then... There it is, the feedback. We've done it. The trick now will be to maintain contact. Oh, wait a minute. What's that? It sounds like a pattern. Huh? Listen. Even numbers. Now odd numbers. Great Scott, do you think we've got something? Follow it. Follow it. Start with an even series. We started following the pattern, and we got nothing. We kept at it all night, most of the next day. Still nothing. Wait. The next night, it's starting to come back to me now. I remember. I remember. It was the sound of the generators that woke me. It was about two in the morning. I padded out along the duck boards to the control building. The lights were on. I went in. And there was Dr. Marlowe. He was sitting at the control panel, and he was strange. His eyes were open, but he didn't seem to see me. Dr. Marlowe? Dr. Marlowe, what is it? What are you doing? Dr. Marlowe! Then, something very odd happened. Half of him came alive. His right side first. His right eye lighting up while his left eye stayed dead. His right hand twitched while his left one remained stiff. And then... What? Oh, oh hello, John. Is uh, anything the matter, Doctor? No. Why should anything? Hey, what am I doing here? Doctor, have you ever walked in your sleep before? Oh, not that I know of. Of course, I haven't been sleeping too well lately. Rather disturbing dreams, but... John, did you change this beam frequency? No, Doctor. You must have done it in your sleep. Shall I switch it back? No. Cut the power, but leave it. I'd like to look at it again in the morning. Do some thinking about it. Somehow, neither of us mentioned it the next day. We just went on with our work, collecting data, trying for another contact, if it had been a contact. And that night, yes, it was that night that we discovered what it meant. The generators woke me again. I looked at my watch. It was almost three o'clock, and for some reason, I was terrified. The door of Roy's room was open. As I went by, I saw that his bed was empty. Then I was walking along the duck boards to the control building. The lights were on again. I looked in through the window. Dr. Marlowe was at the panel as he'd been the night before with that same dead look on his face. And Roy was standing in front of him, talking to him. I could hear him through the window. Dr. Marlowe. Dr. Marlowe, what is it? Is anything wrong? He's asleep. Walking in his sleep. Better get John. He started toward the door. Then, apparently deciding he'd better not leave the generators on, he turned and went toward the master switch. And as he did, Dr. Marlowe moved. His face still dead, expressionless. He got up, took a heavy wrench, and followed Roy. Then, just as Roy put out a hand to throw the switch, he hit him. I saw Roy's body crumple to the floor. I stood there frozen, unable to move. Dr. Marlowe looked down at him for a moment with no sign of emotion on his face. 
Then, like a zombie, he went over to the workbench again, picked up an odd assortment of tools, and returned to Roy's body. He bent over him, looking at him as if he were a laboratory specimen. And as I realized what he was going to do, my paralysis left me. I shouted and started for the door, but just before I reached it, I tripped, hit my head, and that was the last I knew. I'm not sure how long I was out, but when I came to, I was lying in front of the door and a dark shape was bending over me. John, what happened? Keep away from me. Don't touch me. I saw what you did in there. And where? When? Just now, in the control room, to Roy. What do you mean? I just came up here from my cottage. I had a bad dream, came out to get some air, and I found you lying here. But I tell you, I saw you, and... And what? I must have imagined it, dreamed it, because... I thought I saw you kill him. We looked everywhere, but there was no sign of Roy. Then we hurried back to the control building and searched it again. He's not here either, John. No. Must be in my mind. Of course, if it had really happened, there'd be something, if not his body, at least his blood. Where, John? Where would it be? Right here in front of the master switch. But there's nothing. No. Except that the floor is wet. Looks as if it's been scrubbed. Hey, you're right. John, did you change the beam frequency this way? No, Doctor. You must have done it just the way you did last night. Last night? You mean something happened last night, too? You don't remember? No, no. Tell me what you thought you saw happen tonight, whether you believe it or not. Well, you were sitting at the control panel with your eyes open, but as if you were asleep. Yes, the generators were on, and the beam frequency was set the way it is now. Roy was speaking to you, but you didn't answer him. Then when he started to cut the power, you picked up a wrench and hit him. I hit Roy? But that's not the worst of it. After that, you picked up some tools and bent over him as if... Well, as, as if he were a laboratory animal. Telling you about it now, I know the whole thing's mad. It's impossible. I wonder... You mean it could have happened some way? Without your knowing it? In the old project. And in this one. We've been listening for messages from out of space. Trying to determine whether intelligent life exists anywhere in our galaxy. John, if it did exist, what form would it take? Well, it wouldn't necessarily look like us with two arms and legs. Exactly. But... And suppose it existed in a totally different form. In the form of electrical energy. Electrical energy? Why not? Isn't that the way the brain functions? Giving off electromagnetic waves? And what do we know about Deimos? Suppose... Suppose living beings existed there. In the form of complex electrical charges. And a channel were suddenly opened between it and the Earth. Our laser beam. You mean they could travel down and take hold of someone, you... I'm and then... speculating, John. Of course, even if it's true, we don't know if these entities are malevolent, dangerous or not. When they killed, made you kill Roy? Because he was going to shut off the transmitter, cut off contact with their base. As for the rest, well, they'd be very interested in the human body, particularly the brain. They'd want to examine it, study it. Do you realize what you're saying, suggesting, Doctor? Intelligences from out of space, another world... The taking over of a man's body by forces yes, that we... Yes, John, I know what I'm saying. And while I'm only hypothesizing, I don't really believe it's possible. Do you own a gun? Yes. So happens I do. Well, start carrying it. And if you notice me doing anything strange, don't hesitate. Shoot. And shoot to kill. <laughs> I didn't go back to sleep that night. And I was convinced that I would never sleep again. Because it would be then that it would be easiest for them to... No, no, I can't think about it. I won't, even now. I felt a little better in the morning. I went over to have another talk with Dr. Marlowe. But he wasn't at his cottage. He wasn't anywhere on the base. And no one seemed to know where he was. 
Then I called Colonel Gately at headquarters. No one there knew anything about Dr. Marlowe or Roy. But by that time, something had happened to me. It had all become blurred, like an old nightmare that you know was frightening, but whose details you can't remember. About a week later, the colonel called me and asked me to meet him at the police station in the town nearby. You knew Swanson pretty well, didn't you, Parker? Yes, of course. Some fishermen found a body in their nets this morning. We'd like you to look at it. Oh? All right. Brace yourself. Here. Good Lord. I... I can't be certain, but... I'm fairly sure it's Roy. How did he die? We'll have to wait for the coroner's report, but my guess is that he fell off the cliff. And Dr. Marlowe? Nothing new on him yet, but if they were together, his body may turn up soon, too. He was a better prophet than he knew, because Dr. Marlowe came back that very night. I'd taken something to make me sleep. It was the only way I could sleep, but the sound of the generators woke me. I took my gun, went to the control building. The lights were on. I opened the door, and there was Dr. Marlowe. He was standing near the console, his face thin and drawn, and his eyes blank. And when he spoke, his voice was hardly human, as if someone was speaking through him. It is unfortunate that you awaken, Parker, and even more unfortunate that you came in here. What do you mean, Doctor? Where have you been, and why are you talking so strangely? We have been looking over your planet, studying it and its life, particularly you so-called humans. We have found it very interesting. And now, we are ready to go. Go? Go where? Wait. You said we. Dr. Marlowe, have they... You will stay where you are. You will not move. We have some preparations to make. And then... Her voice, that horrible voice, broke off. And Dr. Marlowe swayed as if he were about to fall. I grabbed him, held on to him. And then his eyes changed, came alive. And when he spoke again... It was with his own voice. John. John, for heaven's sake, help me. What? They got me. They took me that night. Took me all over the country, looking, examining, studying. They picked my brain, John. And now they're going to take me with them. Take you? Back to where they come from. Not my body. They're not interested in that. But the essential me. And in heaven's name, shoot, John. Shoot me! And now... We are ready. Look here at his eyes. Look closely. Yes, like that. As your friend told you, we are taking him with us. But you will not remember what has happened. You will remember nothing. Do you understand? Because someday, we may come back. I stood there, frozen, holding Marlowe. Suddenly, he broke my grip, pushed me away. Walking stiffly and mechanically, he went to the door, opened it, and went out along the duck boards to the edge of the cliff. Then, without hesitating, he stepped over the edge and disappeared. Now do you remember, John? It's all true! They exist! And they've got me here. Not only that, but they may return to Earth again for others. And... John, they're coming back now. They're coming. Do something. When I woke up about a half hour ago, I found this all written out on the pad I keep next to my bed. I remember some of what I'd written. But other parts, like Roy's murder and Dr. Marlowe's death... I don't recall at all. Either I'm mad, completely mad, or... No, no, I can't think about that. In any case, if I showed this to anyone, the world would think I was mad. 
There's only one thing to do. Tear it up. Every last page of it. Every last page of it. Every last page of it. Theater 5 has presented Terror from Beyond, written by Robert Newman and directed by Warren Somerville. In the cast, Robert Dryden, Ralph Camargo, and Gilbert Mack. Audio engineers, Marty Folia and Bill Sandreuter. Sound technicians, Ed Blaney and M.C. Brock. Original music composed by Alexander Vlastatsenko. Orchestra under the direction of Glenn Osser. Executive producer for Theater 5, Edward A. Byron. This is Fred Foy speaking. Ladies and gentlemen, I, I have an important announcement to make about a wonderful new discovery. Let me get away with it, see? Unless you stop your work, you're marked for murder. They're all against me. But you've got to listen. You've got to listen to me. Theater 5 presents The Evil That Men Do. Mr. Mayor and members of the Yorkport City Council, the evil that men do lives after them in the form of ever higher taxes and human misery. Forty percent of last year's budget was spent on law enforcement and social agencies for the prevention and control of crime. Unnecessary. I tell you that I can wipe out crime tomorrow. That's ridiculous. Mr. Mayor, why waste the council? Mr. Time? Mayor, Mr. Mayor, let me defend myself. Gentlemen, listen to me, please. Go ahead, doctor, but make it fast. All right. Five years ago, I started experimenting in my laboratory at the university with a new group of tranquilizers. One in particular seemed promising. I called it Benefactral. After the usual laboratory and animal tests, I performed some carefully controlled experiments at Wilson Youth House and also at the Chester Street Jail. The results were remarkable. Benefactual immediately controlled and destroyed every antisocial impulse, every tendency towards crime for a period of 48 hours. It happens before your very eyes. I don't believe it. Gentlemen, it's true. Crime could be wiped out completely by adding benefactual in minute quantities to the city water supply. Anyone who drinks a cup of coffee, a plate of soup, or a lemonade, any liquid containing city water will instantly be free of criminal tendencies for two whole days. Oh, you have to fine. prove it, Doctor. I will accept that challenge. God, bring the prisoner. Now, Mr. Mayor, the man who's being brought in is a, an inmate of Chester Street Jail. He's had five arrests, four convictions, all crimes of violence. He's... Oh, 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 Hello, George. I'm uh, Dr. Alexander Kieran. So what? I won't keep you here long. All I want you to do is uh, drink one glass of water. What's in it? Nothing that will hurt you. Five bucks and you got yourself a deal. All right, five bucks. Here. Uh, now, uh, drink the water. Uh, it tastes okay. Anything else I can do for you, Doc? No, that's all. Uh, here, Doc. Take your five dollars back. I didn't really earn it. No, it's yours. I don't know. I'd I feel funny taking it. It'd be stealing. That's not right. All right, guard, you can loosen that handcuff. Oh, thanks. And, sir, I'm, uh, I'm sorry I caused you any trouble before. Oh, uh, you better take your watch back. I'm ashamed to say I, uh, I snatched it from you as you brought me in. <laughs> Here, I apologize. Oh, Alex? Nancy. 
Nancy. Oh, darling. Oh, Nancy, the most wonderful news. Oh, darling, I'm so happy for you. The demonstration went well. It couldn't have gone better. The mayor and council backed me all the way. Oh. I have complete authorization to treat all city water with Benefactual and enough funds for a one-year tryout to build a pilot plant to manufacture it. For just one year? Well, Nancy, that's all I need. If I can keep Yorkport free of crime for one year with Benefactual, you will witness the... The beginning of a moral revolution which will sweep the world. <laughs> well, if I'm alive to witness it. Uh, uh, alive? Well, don't you see, Alex, that you're upsetting the balance of nature just as other scientists did when they, they killed off so many insects that the birds died. Oh, honey, I, I, I thought you believed in Benefactual. I, I thought you'd be proud and happy that it was being recognized. Well, I'm proud of you, Alex, and I'm happy for you, but I... Look, I've always thought that people could only better themselves by dedication, not medication. I hope I'm wrong, dear. With all my heart, Alex, I hope I'm wrong. But I, I'll get it, dear. You must be tired. Where's that four-eyed squirt who's making trouble for me? Who are you? And what's the meaning of that gun? My name is John Corf, and the gun means business, lady. Out of my way. I want to talk to your husband. Put your gun away. And I'll let you talk to him. What's the matter? You ain't never heard of me? I've heard of big John Corf. But I'm not afraid of you, and neither is my husband. Now, put your gun away and come in. Okay. Okay. That's all I wanted. Alex? Uh, this is John Corus. Cora? Cora? Uh, Big John. The gangster. Hey, I don't like the way you said that, lady. Uh, the newspapers generally call me the head of the Yorkport Crime Syndicate, which is more classy, and which is why I am here, Doc. Anything that isn't strictly legit in this town, I get a cut of it. And I expect to continue, Dr. Kieran, without you butting into it. Oh, I haven't done anything to you, Mr. Carl. And you ain't gonna. But you take my boys and make them go straight with that dope of yours, and I won't have any rackets left and nobody to run them. Oh, I see. You know, I, I didn't realize that I'd be hurting anybody, but I'm... Uh, perfectly willing to hear your point of view. Nancy, fix us a drink, would you please? Of course. You'll join me, won't you? Okay, Doc. Uh, scotch and water. The uh, special scotch for Mr. Koroff, dear. Well, thanks. You're the right guy, Doc. Well, I take that as a compliment. But that don't mean I'm going to go easy on you. Some of my best friends, they get taken care of. You know what I mean? And this idea of yours, Doc, just ain't going to go through. Well, the city council has given me... I complete... know, I know, I know. But I'll give you 50 grand to forget the formula. And a bullet in your back if you don't. Oh, thanks for the drink, Mrs. Mm -hmm. Thanks, dear. Well, here's mud in your eye. Hey, <laughs> that's good scotch. Now, look, Doc... You think about what I said. Yes, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking. Uh, 50,000? Make it 100. Uh, wait a minute, I can't do that. That's bribery. <laughs> I don't know what I was thinking of. Not to speak of a bullet. That, that's murder. Yes, I've heard. You know, Alex... When you really think about it, crime don't pay. A lot of heartache, that's all. You really feel that way, John? One hundred percent. You know, Alex, I think I'm going to resign from the mafia. I find myself in fundamental disagreement with its purposes and policies. <laughs> Despite delays and difficulties in getting Dr. Kieran's water treatment plant into operation, the crime rate in Yorkport has dropped drastically due to the disorganization of the crime syndicate formerly headed by Big John Corrin. <laughs> the name still frightens me. When I opened the door and saw that... Oh, uh... that's over, dear. Now he's my friend and biggest supporter. Well, I hope he stays friendly. Don't worry. I'll see to it that he does. Every 48 hours, I give him a dose of Benefactual. He knows that he needs it. Well, suppose he were sick and couldn't come or, or just out of the city. Alex, you're leaning on such a slender reed. Oh, now, Nancy, don't start that again, please. Look, to everybody but my wife, I'm a hero. Oh, Alex. But it's true. There's a delegation coming to see me in a few minutes just to congratulate me. Chief of Police Roberts and Jim Rutgers, some big businessman. Just to congratulate you? Well, I suppose so. They didn't say, but, you know. 
Oh, well, that must be them. Will you show them in there? Certainly. Oh, How do you do, Miss Kern? Yes, I want to see you right away. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, Chief Roberts. Good afternoon, Mr. Rutgers. Have a seat. <laughs> well, Chief Roberts, I, I guess I'm making your work a lot easier these days. Huh? You're uh, making my work easier, but my life harder. I, I beg your pardon? Doctor, I'm John Rutgers, president of the Rutgers Lock Company. You know, the trouble with you scientists is that you don't think things through. I'm afraid I don't understand what... I'll level with you, Doctor. We represent hundreds of people. You may not know it, but you're trying to ruin us. And we're not going to let you. Ruin you? I think very highly of you. My lock company employs a lot of people here in your ports. If you put us out of business, you'll upset the economy. I've spent 25 years in police work. I'm a highly trained man, but trained only for crime detection. I'm a dedicated servant of the community. I won't take this lying down. Now, we're not talking just for ourselves. And we warn you that we're not going to stand for this. Oh, now, wait a minute. Are you, are you threatening me? Take it any way you like. But if you don't listen to us, some of the boys from Big John's old organization may call on you. Oh, look, I'm not going to be blackmailed. I'll take this to the public. I'll take my case to the citizens through the newspapers. You're being naive, Karen. The newspapers need stories about robberies, assaults, and crimes of passion. If they helped you eliminate crime completely, they'd be cutting their own throats. And uh, that's a crime. You trying to tell me that the newspapers, that, that responsible citizens want crime? It's not as simple as that, Kieran. You're upsetting the balance of nature. Oh, yes, I've heard that before. We're not threatening you, but... But if you don't stop, somebody, I don't know who, but somebody is going to make you a dead duck. Alex, please give it up. Don't try to reform the world. It isn't ready. Nancy, I can't surrender. You've got to. Now, don't you see, five minutes after you came home from the council meeting... The mayor and his political henchmen sent their first emissary. Oh, well, I, I don't follow you. Well, then you must be blind, Alex. Now, how else would Big John Corth know about a secret meeting of the city council so soon? Oh, Alex, darling, please give up the whole benefactual project. Nancy, I can't and I won't. Well, then you'll need help from someone who understands the use of, of force. Now, when will John Corth report here again? Well, he should be here this afternoon. His 48-hour dosage period ends tonight. Well, when he comes... Now, darling, speak to him. He's your friend and ally. He's got to help you. Because you need help. Oh, good afternoon, John. I, I was wondering if you'd forgotten. I got to apologize for being late, Alex. But you see, I'm taking this here course in flower arranging at the Y. Oh, I wish my problems were made of flowers. Hey, what's bugging you, Alex? Look, John, a delegation visited me representing everyone in Yorkport who makes a living out of crime. My old gang? Well, they're in on it, but the leaders are the chief of police and Rutgers, the lock manufacturer. And they say that they have the backing of everyone who has a financial stake in the commission, prevention, or the fear of crime. They demand that I forget all about the benefactual project or threaten me with murder. Murder? That's not nice. Not nice at all. John, I need your help. I don't know how to deal with this, but you, you you've lived in a world of force and Please violence. And... Don't remind me. I need that kind of experience to deal with the threats to my life. Well, not so fast, my dear friend. That murder, like I said, that's a bad thing. But isn't it much worse if we take the law into our own hands? I'm not taking the law into my own hands. I'm just asking you to help protect me from this conspiracy. Well, I don't see how I could. Naturally, I threw away my rods, you know, my guns, because I didn't have no license. I couldn't even protect myself from a fly bite. But I keep thinking, if only we could make all those guys, a police chief and all as nice as me, they wouldn't think of bumping you off. John! That's it. I should have thought of it before. 
Look, we're not going to wait for the water treatment plant to be finished. Tonight, you and I are going to take some barrels of Benefactor and dump them in the city reservoir. But it's against the law to dump things in the water. I think your plan is... Doing... No, 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 John, it isn't. We'll just be doing it earlier than planned. It's perfectly legal. Look, will you, will you help me? Well, if you put it that way, sure, why not? I'd be glad to. Great. Now, here's what I want you to do. You go right away and hire a truck. Yeah, yeah, sure. Now, don't tell anyone what you need it for. Uh Then, at 11 o'clock tonight, you come here. Okay. We load the truck, take it to the reservoir, and by tomorrow, there won't be anyone in town who'll have the slightest impulse to commit any crime of violence against me. Doc, that's a great idea. I'd better get going. Well, the faster the better. But remember, John, don't raise anyone's suspicions. Stay out of sight until 11. 11 on the button. I'll be seeing you. I'll be here. Thanks. So long. Nancy! Nancy, come here quick. What is it? What is it, Alex? Everything's all fixed. There isn't going to be any trouble. Oh, wonderful. By tomorrow, the danger will be totally gone. By tomorrow? How come by tomorrow? Tonight, we're treating the water in the reservoir with benefactual. We? You mean you and me? Well, I'd like to help you, No, no, no. John Corriff and me. John promised he'd be here at 11 tonight. Oh. You you mean you spoke to him when he came in for a dose of benefactual? Benefactual? Nancy... He forgot it. He what? Oh, we were talking about the threat to my life, and he forgot it. We both forgot it. And how long will this present dose be effective? I don't know, until 6 o'clock, 7 at the latest. Oh, I... Alex, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? <laughs> Darling, I don't know where he can be. I've called everywhere. Uh, I think he'll be here. Well, maybe, but in what conditions? Uh, uh, now we'll see. Now, Alex, be careful. Hi, Doc. Well, here I am, just like I said. Oh, John, we were worried about you. You forgot to get your dose of Benefactor. (laughs) Alex and I were afraid that you might have changed back to the way you were. Never gave it a thought. Yeah. Well, you'd uh, better have some Benefactor before we forget. Ah, Doc, I I don't need it. I think I'm changed permanent. Well, take it anyway, John, just to be sure. I tell you, Doc, I don't need it. Now, come on now. We've got things to do. I got the truck out in the laboratory. We'll pile the stuff on and get out to the reservoir. <laughs> and Nancy, you see, there was nothing to worry about. Come on, let's go, John. Uh, a couple of hundred yards further, John, then turn right. I get it. Say, Doc, how long will this load of stuff... Uh... You know, the benefactor will uh, keep you up what doped up. Doped up? Well, you know what I mean. Fixed. So that nobody will do anything violent. Oh, about four months, I figure, if they keep on drinking this water. And that gives us a chance to get the regular treatment system in operation. This gives us a bigger chance than that, Alex. Well, what's bigger than that? Now, listen to me. All my life, I wanted to have a city just laid out for me. A model city. Model for crime, that is. Now, thanks to you, I got it. John, I don't understand you. I'll spell it out. All you and me have to do is stay away from that water. Then everybody else reforms. And we pick all the meat off the bones and go to town. John. Look, you're not thinking of committing a crime. Why, I thought... That I'd gone straight blaming it. But you were still playing me for a patsy. I get it. Nobody does that to Big John. Not for long. But you go along with me, Doc. And I'll cut you in for a piece of the take. And uh, if I refuse? Refuse? Wouldn't make no sense. I got all the benefactor all I need right here in the truck. And I also got a gun. Brand new gun. So, here we are, Doc Kieran. Just you and me. The beginning of a great partnership or the end of the road. You choose. No. I won't let my work be perverted. You'll have to shoot me. Doc. It wouldn't be the first time I've had to knock off a friend. Okay. Out and walk. All right, Carl. 
This is Chief Roberts. Drop the gun. We have you covered on all sides. You heard the chief, John. You better drop the gun. All right. I'll shoot. Okay, boys, move in and grab him. Mrs. Kern, you can come out now. Nancy. Oh, darling, you're all right. Oh, darling, I had to call the police out. You mean you, you knew that Carl was faking tonight? Well, I didn't know, dear, but I'm not for sure, but I, I know that when you try to interfere with the evil that men do, you're looking for trouble. And I wouldn't trade my husband for a, a city full of angels. <laughs> of Glen Oster. Carl? Is that you? You come back. Carl, you come back to me. No, that can't be. Carl's dead. No, he's not dead. It's all been a bad dream. He's come back from a trip just like always. Oh, in a minute he'll come upstairs and come to bed. Oh, I knew he'd come back. There, see? He's climbing the stairs. I'd better get up. You'll probably be tired after such a long trip. Carl? Is that you, Carl? Carl, why don't you answer me? I know you're there, Carl. Carl? Why are you hiding from me? Carl? Carl? Carl! Theater 5 presents Homecoming. Mother, what did you want? Come in and sit down, Helen. Let me get you a cup of coffee. It's still warm. Well, I don't have all day. I've got to get home to pick the kids up after school. You look tired. Are you tired? Let me fix you something. No, Mother, I'm not tired and I'm not hungry. Now, what is it you had me come all the way over here for? You said it was important. It is important. Now, sit down while I fix you something to eat and we'll talk. I know you, so busy with the children, you don't have time to think of yourself. All right, I am sitting. The children are fine. Harry is fine. I'm fine. Harry sent you his love. Now, what is it? You had too many children too soon. I always said... Oh, now, let's not start that again. You never listened to me. Mother, if you got me over here to argue about the children... I'm not arguing. Then what are we shouting about? Who's shouting? Why is it we can never discuss anything in this family without yelling at each other? Oh... Mother, I'm sorry. I didn't mean that. Well, maybe it's better we shouldn't discuss it. Mother, please, I apologize. I'm sorry. I keep forgetting this always happens when you're upset about something. Now, tell me, what is it? Why should you care? I'm old, alone. Mother, please. Why should you care? Mother. You'll only laugh, say I'm crazy. I won't laugh, and I won't say you're crazy. Now, what is it? Helen. Helen, last night... Your father came home. 
Oh, no. You see? You're impossible. You think I'm crazy. Mother, Daddy's been dead over a year now. You only think so. Mother, I was there. I saw him. We both saw him dead and buried. A stranger was buried. Mother. Your father is alive and came home last night. Daddy's dead. When are you going to accept that? Your father never died. He came back to me last night. Mother, we've been all over this before. If you don't want to discuss it, why don't you say so? I tell you, he was in the house last night. Did you talk to him? No. Did you see him? No. Then how do you know he was here? I heard him. Oh, no. So don't believe me. All right, Mother, what happened? Uh, last night, I couldn't sleep. About two o'clock, I heard the car door slam in the garage, and I woke up. You know, he was always coming back from his trips early in the morning. So you heard a neighbor's car door slam, and you thought it was Daddy. It was his car, I tell you. I looked out the window and saw it parked in the garage. That's impossible. Harry sold Dad's car over a year ago. We have the papers to prove it. It was his car, I tell you. Are you trying to tell me I wouldn't recognize the family car if I saw it? All right, it was his car. Then what happened? It was dark, so I just lay in bed listening. I was scared at first, but then I started thinking, he's come back to me. He's come back to me. And I was so happy I didn't have time to be scared anymore. Then what happened? Oh, Helen, it was so beautiful. It was just like old times again. I heard him stop in the kitchen to look in the refrigerator. You remember he always used to have a bite of something to eat before he came to bed, especially after a trip. For a minute, I thought I'd go down and fix him something. But then I heard him start to climb the stairs. And? I don't know what happened then. I began to be frightened again, I think. A woman alone, it could have been a prowler, who knows. So I started to call his name. Carl? Carl? I ran to the hall calling his name. But I must have frightened him because by the time I got to the hall, he was gone. I looked all through the house and he was nowhere to be found. And how about the car? That was gone, too. I went outside and looked. I ran around the house calling for him. Mother! Well, I had to find him. I knew he was here, and I had to find him. Mother, you, you didn't run around outside in the middle of the night calling for Daddy in your nightgown, did you? He was here, and I frightened him away. Mother, this is insane. Oh, you don't understand. I love your father. Mother! Young people today, they don't understand what love is. But your father and I, we had something rare, something rich, something beyond words. Not one of these modern convenient things of today. That's not true. Helen! It's not true and you know it. You and Daddy never loved each other. Helen, how can you say such a thing? Because I grew up with it and I saw it. I won't listen. Mother, I was here, I saw why, whole days would pass when the two of you would barely speak to each other. I won't listen. And why do you think Daddy chose to sell on the road? He had plenty of chances for a job here in the city, but he turned them all down. You know why? Because he wanted to be away from you as much as possible. I won't listen to such a thing. None of it's true. Mother, you have to listen. Now, it's time you face things. It's been almost 18 months since Daddy died. And you've done nothing but mope around this house and make him into something he wasn't. It's time you got out and, and associated with people your own age. I won't disgrace the memory of your father. Face the memory of my father, Mother. My father was a very bitter, unhappy man. He was a great man. Maybe you didn't love him. I loved him as much as anybody, but I know what he was and what he wasn't. He hated you, he hated me, he hated this house, everything. I often think he'd die just to get out of it. Helen! It's the truth and you know it. And since he died, you've made him into something unrecognizable, something he never was. Now you begin to believe he comes back to visit you at night. Mother, you've got to get out of this house. Why, you've still got your sanity. 
There's nothing wrong with my sanity. Well, you imagine he comes to visit? I you? don't imagine. He comes. Mother, if you don't move out of here, Harry and I are going to see if we can't do something legal to get you out. You'll never do it. This was the house your father and I built together. We raised our children here. It's a shrine, sacred to his memory. It's an empty shell. Nothing ever happened here. No love ever passed between you. Get out. Mother, listen Get to me. Get out of my house. Oh, Mother, please. Nobody disgraces the memory of my husband that way. Not even his own daughter. Not in my house. Mother. Out and never come back. I never want to see you again. <laughs> dream. You can't come back. You're dead. Helen said you were dead. But she's wrong. She has to be wrong. I know. Now you're looking in the refrigerator just like before. Now you'll come upstairs. Yes, you come back. Please, God, let it be Carl. I wasn't frightened in this time. I must keep calm and keep from crying out. Carl? Is that you, dear? So who else would it be? The milkman? Oh, is it really you, Carl? Who did you think it was? Your brother coming for a loan? Oh, Carl. It's so good to have you back. Well, what's good about it? I'm here. Oh, Carl, please don't talk like that. Like what? You know, flip, smart alecky, like you always do. Aren't you happy to see me? I'm always happy to see you, my love, though there isn't much to see in the dark. Oh, Carl, I've missed you so much. I'm gone ten days to Rochester, and all of a sudden she misses me. If I'd known, I'd have sent you a postcard. But you don't understand. You're dead. Dead? You bet I'm dead. 300 miles I've driven today and half of it in the last two hours. I'm so dead I could fall down and never see daylight again. No, you don't understand. I mean, dead in the ground and buried. So they finally caught up to me. For the last 20 years I've been walking around dead and somebody finally did me a favor and buried me. Carl, be serious. About my funeral, I'm always serious. Carl, Helen said you were dead. She said you were visiting the grandchildren at her house. You had a heart attack and died. Well, you should always listen to what Helen said. I did at first. But when she started talking about preparations for the funeral, then I knew she was lying. Well, why should Helen lie about a thing like uh, that? You don't know, Helen. She's always been jealous of you toward me. Oh, Helen's a good girl. There you go, taking her side again. I'm not taking any sides. I just want to get some sleep. Is that all you came back for, to sleep? You've got a better suggestion? Oh, here we are, arguing again. Well, who's arguing? You are. I am not. Oh, Carl, Carl, don't you see? They said you were dead, but I wouldn't believe them. If I wouldn't believe them, then it wouldn't be true. Well, you should learn to listen to people, Agatha. Is that what you want, Carl? To be dead? So far, you're doing all the wanting. I'm just listening. Oh, Carl, you don't know how I've hoped and prayed you'd come back to me. I'm here. But are you alive or dead? Well, what do you think? I don't know what to think anymore. I think we're both dead. I think we died a long time ago. I'm going to turn on the light. What for? So I can see for myself. Agatha, no. Leave the light off. For both our sakes, it's better with the light off. Let's just go to bed and sleep. 
Are you all right? What do you mean, all right? I mean, you... You don't look terrible, do you? Your skin and everything. I look the same as when I left for Rochester ten days ago. You never did think I was a handsome man. I'm going to turn on the light. I didn't know, Agatha, not now. We can see each other in the morning. There's plenty of time for that. That's it, isn't it? What? You are dead, aren't you? And you came back to me because I believed hard enough that you would. Yes. How long will you stay? As long as you want me. Oh, we can start all over again from the beginning. Pick up from where we left off would be more to the point. Oh, Carl. Carl, you don't know how happy that makes me. I'm glad. You won't keep traveling on the road, will you? I don't know. I've been on the road a long time now. I've been thinking of retiring. Oh, if you only knew how I've hoped you'd give up traveling and come home at night, like other men do, to be with me. But I've always enjoyed traveling, Agatha. The freedom of the car, seeing new faces. And getting away from me. That's not true. Helen said it was. Helen doesn't know everything. She knows you. And not completely. Well, enough. She said you traveled just to get away from me because you hated me. That's not true. Isn't it? All right, all right. I traveled just to get away from you. I died for the same reason. I couldn't stand being in the same room with you. Now, are you satisfied? Why must you be so cruel to me? Why must you nag me to death? Oh, Carl, Carl. This isn't going at all the way I wanted it to. Why can't we be kind to each other? I am kind. No, I mean really kind. Gentle and understanding of each other. I'm trying to understand, Aggie. Hold me. What? Take me in your arms and hold me. Well, Agatha, I've been on the road all day. I'm beat. You always have some excuse. It's not an excuse. I'm tired, physically tired. You don't love me. Agatha, for 25 years of marriage, we haven't touched or held each other. It's a little late in the day to start now. Now is the time to start. Agatha, I'm beat, physically beat. I'm tired and want to go to sleep. Can't you get that through your thick head? You're inhuman. Oh, good grief. You always were and always will be. My mother said that before I married you, but I wouldn't listen. She said you were a self-centered man and always would be. Just leave me alone. I'll leave you alone. Strictly alone. Go to sleep. Ignore me. Do what you like. You always have. I don't care. But that's just the problem. I do care. I care so very much. Oh, Carl, why do we have to do the same things in the same old way? The fighting and the hatred. Why can't we start over again and try loving each other? Really loving each other. <sighs> Uh, we have this chance, this one chance. Let's make the most of it. I know the fights we have. I start myself. I don't mean to. It's just I'm so afraid and unsure of myself. I demand sometimes, and I don't mean to. If you tell me when I'm doing it, I try not to. But we have to try together. You have to work at it, too. Carl? Carl? Are you listening to me? Carl? Are you asleep? Oh, Carl? How can you? How can you? No, dear God. Please. Let me wake up tomorrow and let him be gone. Take him back to wherever he came from and let me be alone again. (laughs) 
Hello? Mother, is that you? Who else would it be? Oh, are you all right? Of course I'm all right. Why shouldn't I be? Well, because last night I, I got the strangest phone call, Mother. It was from a man who sounded like Daddy. He said he was going home. Mother, Daddy isn't there, is he? How can he be here? He's dead. But you've been saying he's been coming back to visit you. An old woman's imagination. You said so yourself. What are you trying to do? Get me put away? Mother, are you sure nothing happened last night? You sound terribly upset. Helen, your father's dead. Now leave me alone. Mother. Goodbye, Helen. Your father's dead. Let's leave him there. Presented Homecoming, written by George Bamber and directed by Warren Somerville. In the cast, Margaret Hamilton, Mary Jane Higby, and Dan Otto. Audio engineer, Neil Pulse. Sound technician, Ed Blaney. Story editor, Jack C. Wilson. Original music by Alexander Vlas Dotsenko. Orchestra under the direction of Glenn Osser. Executive producer for Theater 5, Edward A. Byron. We invite and appreciate your comments. Please address Theater 5, New York 23, New York. This is Fred Foy speaking. This has been an ABC Radio Network production. Fred, who's that man? Huh? That man in the guest room. Mary, what are you talking about? There's a strange man asleep in our guest room. Theater 5 presents The Stranger. Give me another minute or a half an hour or something. Well, the bathroom's ready for you. I'll go down and make breakfast. Okay. Say, how about making me some sausage this morning? All right. Give me some men who are stout-hearted men who will fight for the right thing you know. Shoulder to shoulder and bolder. Fred! Huh? What is it? Fred? Who's that man? What? That man in the guest room. Mary, what are you talking about? I'm talking about the man in the guest room. Maybe all right, but I should think you would have told me you brought someone home with you last night. Wait a minute. When what? I think of it, I went right past the guest room door, practically undressed. This Mary, night. will you stop talking and let me get a word in? Are you telling me there's somebody in the guest room? Yes. A, a man? Yes. Well, I didn't bring any man home with me last night. But well, where did this man come from? What, what time did you get in last night? I don't know, 11.30, I guess. And the guest room was empty then? I don't think I looked into it. Well, I got home about 1.30 and... No, I, I guess I didn't look into the guest room either. Th this man in the guest room, wh what's he doing? He's lying in bed, apparently fast asleep. Well, I think we'd just better wake him up. W w what if he has a gun? Oh, Mary, don't be ridiculous. Come on. Listen, Fred, I'm afraid. Honey, look, don't worry. We'll turn this guy out of the house or over to the police or whatever. No, no look at him. He's still asleep. Mm. Hey. Hey, you. Come on, wake up. Wake up. The party's over. Oh, oh, oh. Good, good morning, Fred. Good morning, Barry. Who are you? Well, don't you know? Of course he doesn't know, and neither do I. Who are you? You don't know either? No, I don't. 
Well, this is a pretty situation. Look, stop stalling and get out of that bed. I'm not stalling. I I'm trying to figure out what to do. No, I just bet you are. Oh, what the devil? I'm not going to take the rap. I'm going to tell the truth. We'd like to hear it. All right. Now, last night was your bridge night, wasn't it, Mary? How did you know that? And it was your bowling night, Fred. Isn't that right? That's right, and I don't know how you knew it, but it's got nothing to do with the it's fact that you everything broke to into do our with house. My presence here, and I didn't break into your house. This is a very delicate situation. Mary's bridge night, Fred's bowling night, but... Well, let me put it this way. One of you is putting me in a most embarrassing position because, you see, one of you didn't go bowling or bridge playing. And that one brought me home and invited me to stay a week. What are you talking about? I was invited to stay here in this house for one week by one of you. He or she seems to have changed his or her mind. I went bowling last night, and I never saw you before in my life. I played bridge last night, and I never saw you before either. You see? One of you is lying. <laughs> well, that's imp... Uh-huh. It gives us all something to think about. Doesn't it? Look here, if you are suggesting that my you wife... You tell me that my husband... One of you was very clever to say what you just said. Still, it's going to be a strain, isn't it, to keep it up. I tell you what, I have a suggestion. What is it? Well, it's born of the fact that I'm hungry. Why don't we talk this over at breakfast like sensible, civilized people? You've got a nerve. You are going to give me some breakfast, aren't you? Mary, I think we ought to. It'll give us a little time to think. Now, look, there. you go on downstairs. I'll stay here with this character while he gets dressed. More coffee? Oh, thank you. I will, yes. Are you ready to talk now? Well, I really told you all I have to say. Oh, this is good coffee, Mary. So glad you like it. I'm willing to answer questions if you have any. All right. Now, you say one of us brought you home last night. Which one? Now, that's the question I'm not going to answer. Why not? Well, the person who brought me home doesn't want his or her husband or wife to know where he or she was last night. And you know what? On reflection... I can see why. This is ridiculous. Of course it is. You came home about 11.30, right? Yes. And I got home about 1.30. And by that time, Mary was asleep. Now, where does that get either of you? Well, I've got a question. According to your story, you knew one of us, only one of us. But when you woke up this morning, you called us both by name. Now, how do you account for that? The person I was with last night talked about the person he or she was married to. As a matter of fact... Under the circumstances, it was quite natural to do so. What circumstances? One of you knows very well what circumstances, and the other will have to guess. Fred, were you with your bowling team last night? Yes. How about you? I played bridge at Agatha's house. That's what you say. What do you mean by that? I mean that's what you say. He says differently. No, he doesn't. He says differently about you. Oh, this is great. This is. I've been reading for years about the kind of thing that goes on in the suburbs, the discontented wives... The philandering husbands. And I'll tell you the truth, I honestly didn't think it applied to this suburb, or at least to this house in this suburb. What are you trying to pretend, Fred? That I've ha had an affair? I don't know what has happened, but I know I'm going to find out one thing. What's Agatha's phone number? SC44099. What do you think you're going to find out? I am just going to get a couple of things straightened out. Believe me, it's time we got the cards out on the table. Now, we'll just find out. What... Uh, hello, Agatha. Uh, this is Fred Denton. Uh, Agatha, Mary has gone out this morning, and I can't find a little black notebook that she was carrying for me last night. I, I wonder if she left it at your house. Oh, I see. What, she, she was there, wasn't she? She was either supposed to go to your house or... Oh, yeah, that's right. It, it, it was bridge night. Okay, well, uh, the notebook will probably turn up. Thanks, Agatha. Bye. Give me that phone. And what do you think you're doing? Never you mind. You just never mind. Don't think you're the only one that can go around checking up on things. Well, the, uh, hello? Uh, Harry? Well, this is Mary. Listen, Harry, uh, confidentially... What is the best bowling score my husband ever had? 
Oh, I see. Well, he hasn't been bragging then. Uh, what did he bowl the last time? Oh, that's right. It was last night, wasn't it? No, I just didn't think he was that good, and I've been kidding him. Well, thank you, Harry. Bye. Mary. Yes, Fred. I'm ashamed. I'm ashamed, too. Of course, either Agatha or Harry was fixed beforehand. You shut up. All right, if you want me to. I trust my wife implicitly. That's and splendid. And I trust my husband. Admirable. What is your game, anyhow? It doesn't seem to do much good for me to tell the truth to you people. You're going to tell the truth before I get through with you. You bet you are coming in here and upsetting us this way. Now, you've had your breakfast, and you probably think you're going to leave now. Well, you're not. You're going to stay in this house until we get to the bottom of all this. Of course I am. I've been invited for a week. May I come in, Fred? Sure. Where is he? He's sitting on our sun porch as if he owned it, reading one of our books. Well, I wouldn't have let it go on this way if it weren't that I run the business from home here. I should hope not. I wouldn't want to be alone with him. But in all of these days, what is it, three or four days, we haven't found out a thing. Well, we found out his name is Bert. If it is his name. And he's just been divorced and has no place to go. Yeah, if he was ever married, which, frankly, I doubt. Mm. Or do you find him attractive, Mary? What do you mean by that? Hang it all. I just want to know why he is here. Because you told him he couldn't leave. Which fitted in perfectly with his plan. Oh, this is too much. Look, I'm going to see that guy. You stay here. I want to talk with him alone. No, and it's not what you're thinking. I didn't say a word, did I? You looked. Go ahead. Go and talk to him. Whatever you have to say. Well, Bert, taking your ease on my sun porch, I see. Oh, just a moment, Fred. Wait until I finish this paragraph, will you? Oh, I won't wait. Wait. Well, you're pretty hopped up. You bet I am. Why are you causing trouble around here? Am I? You know you are, and you're enjoying it, too. Well, why not? I'm a student of human nature. I've had enough. Good. Now, let's see you smile after that. Or that. Stop it. Stop it. All right. Your husband has a cut on his cheek. You'd better fix it. I'll give you more than that. I said stop it. What are you doing here anyway, Mary? I told you I wanted to talk to him alone. If you want to know, I was in the dining room listening. Oh, you were? Well, then, if you were listening... You now know this character and I never saw each other before. No, I don't. Anything you said to each other can be taken either way. Either he came home with you that night, or you have no idea who he is. Nothing you said told me a thing. <laughs> Think back on the conversation, Fred. She's right. Nobody knows any more now than you did that morning you found me here. Still and all, in view of the fact that we've had this fight, I'll go or I'll stay, just as you please. If I leave now, you'll never see me again. And you'll never know, will you? So, shall I go? Stay. Stay. <laughs> <laughs> Everything's under control, including dinner. Oh, is it really that way? Mm -hmm. I've been catching up on some work I should have done earlier this week. Well, dinner's ready. Uh, and uh, our guest? Upstairs. Do you know, Mary, we haven't said a single thing about why Bert is here or that fantastic story he gave us or, or anything at all since he and I had that fight. I know. Of course, I don't know what you're saying to him while I'm here in the office. Now, Fred, I thought we agreed we would just forget those suspicions. Oh, I didn't mean it that way, honey. What I mean is it's, it, it's, it's actually been kind of pleasant since the fight. Well, I hate to agree, but that's true. It's been as if you were, I don't know... One of the family. That's right. It's all wrong, of course. <laughs> I know. The truth of the matter is that... Uh, since the fight, we've all been getting along beautifully, and we haven't found out a thing. 
Well, it's just been easier for us to be pleasant because we're pleasant suburban people. That's what I mean. And you know something, Fred? What? This is our last chance. What do you mean? He was going to stay a week. At 1.30 tomorrow night, that week is over. At 11.30 tomorrow oh, night. Oh, no, please, Fred. Well, sometime tomorrow night. Yes. All right, we've got a little more than 24 hours to find out all about this man and what he's been up to, right? Now, is dinner ready? Yes. Okay, come on. And let's make it a pretty tough dinner for him. Mary, you couldn't have pleased me more. I love goulash. Well, I'm glad. Look here, my friend. You have been here now almost a week. You know, I was thinking of that myself. I'm going to miss you two people. Well, we are not going to miss you. Oh, now, I take offense at that. I really believed you, Fred. I think tonight would be an excellent time for you to explain yourself, Bert. You mean speak right out in public and tell you who brought me here last week? Either that or what joke you're playing. Oh, no, I couldn't be that cruel to you. It, it would be better, wouldn't it? Uh, for you to think in the years to come that possibly I was just kidding. What we want from you right now, Bert, is the truth. I've never told you anything else. The whole truth. How long do you cook the noodles? The whole truth, and now. My week is up tomorrow night. I suppose I can see your point of view, but, uh, well, it isn't always wise to insist on knowing things that might hurt you. Will you stop all that nonsense and just tell us what you have to tell us? I was going to say it isn't always wise, but if people insist on knowing, they usually can find out. So? We have more than 24 hours. I don't want to ruin an excellent meal, but uh, I can give you a promise. What is it? Well, I arrived in this house sometime between 11.30 and 1.30 a week ago tomorrow night. By tomorrow night, at that time, you, Fred, and you, Mary, won't have any further doubts. Look, you, I want an answer from you, and I want it now. Well, you're not going to get it. Stand up. Oh, oh. Now, wait a minute. What, now, what do you think tell us what's going stop on it, here? Stop it. Stop it. Are you going to tell me? Fred, stop it. Don't hit him. I've... All right, Mary. Now, look, I've said all I've had to say. And you listen to me, you two. Tomorrow night, both of you will be quite certain that you know the truth. Bert? 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 Where have you seen Bert? Well, no, I I've been here in the office since 7 a.m. Why? Well, I went to call him for breakfast and Freddie's gone. What do you mean? He's nowhere in this house. Let me look. I tell you, I've looked everywhere. I don't doubt it. And I've called him and called him. I tell you, he's gone. I'm sure he's gone, but what I want to see Perhaps is... Perhaps see if his clothes are there. It's not his clothes I'm interested in. Mary, where's my watch? Well, how should I know? I left it here on this bureau. Well, what did he... Exactly. Where are you going? To check on other things. What other things? The silverware, for one oh, thing. Man. Gone. Oh, this is awful. We have been the prize suckers, the prize fools. Fred. What? Look, the Ming vase is gone. Sit down. Let's not look any further. I'm sure every small object we've got that's worth anything is gone. Oh. Oh. What are you laughing at? Oh, darling, you know it's not awful at all. Don't you see? It's over. Oh. Oh. Yes. Yes, Fred, you're right. Yes, it's over. <laughs> Ah, oh, darling, if oh. I could only tell you the suspicions I had of you. Well, I had the same suspicions of you. Ah, <laughs> oh, darling, it's just wonderful. Let him have the stuff. He was nothing but a burglar. A confidence man, a racketeer. Oh, darling. Oh, Mary, my love. <laughs> hey, you think we ought to report this to the police? Well, I hadn't thought about it. What do you think? Oh, I don't suppose they could get any of that stuff back for us. No. Still. No. 
Maybe you're right. It wouldn't be wise to report it. Well, I, I, I didn't say we shouldn't report it. I... Well, of course you did. Mercy, do you think I have anything to fear from reporting this? Well, does that mean you think I have? Now, Fred, let's not quarrel. Well, you said that... No, no. <laughs> let's not quarrel. Well, uh, will we report it to the police? Well, I'll leave it to you. It might make us a laughing stock. That's true. Yeah, that... Oh, look, we, we don't have to spar around this way as if we were still suspicious of one another. No. Why don't we just decide not to report it and, and agree that this is the decision of both of us? That's much the best way. Let's just put aside all doubts of one another. Yes. Just say, I love you. I love you. And I love you. And we can prove it, too, Fred, this very night. No doubts, no suspicions. This is your bowling night and my bridge night. Hey, that's right. You go to your bridge and I'll go to my bowling. And we'll just forget the whole ridiculous business. <laughs> I love you, Mary. And I love you, Fred. But I'm not going to my bridge party. There's a drugstore across from the bowling alley, and I'm going to be there in the window with an ice cream soda, seeing whether he goes bowling or not. And if he checks me, it will be easy to get the girls to say that I was playing bridge. No bowling for me. I'll be in the bushes opposite Agatha's house. The guys will cover for me in case she checks. I'm going to find out about her for certain, one way oh, or the other. No. Fred, but he's not going to make a fool of me. She is the greatest girl in the world, but if she's putting anything over on me, I'm going to find out. Presented The Stranger, written by Robert Senadella and directed by Warren Somerville. In the cast, Elliot Reed, Elspeth Eric, and James Monks. Audio engineer, Bill Sandreuter. Sound technician, M.C. Brock. Script editor, Jack C. Wilson. Original music by Alexander Vlastotsenko. Orchestra under the direction of Glenn Osser. Executive producer for Theater 5, Edward A. Byron. We invite your comments. Write to Theater 5, New York 23, New York. This is Fred Foy speaking. This has been an ABC Radio Network production. Yes. Did you wake? Yes, I've been lying here with my eyes open. Something's wrong, isn't it? Shh. Don't wake the children. It's the oxygenator, isn't it? Yes, but that's not all. I thought so. The motor? No, the motor's fine. You can hear it for yourself. It's the generator I'm worried about. What's wrong with it? The fuel tanks. I think the blast shook them and they developed a slow leak. We've been losing fuel steadily for over three months now. Isn't there anything we can do to fix it? You know as well as I do that we can't. They're buried the same as we are. Forty feet away, under twenty feet of earth. Even if I could dig over to them, it wouldn't do any good. The fuel's almost gone. Oh, Ed, what are we going to do? I don't know. How much time do we have left? I don't know. One day, maybe two. Oh, Ed, I'm frightened. And for the children's sake, try not to be. What are we going to do? Try to live today just as if it were any other day. <laughs> Theater 5 presents A House of Cards. Ah, uh, 
everybody get up. Another day. Come on. What what time is it? It's time to get ready for school. Oh, I don't want to have school again today. I want to go outside and play. Now, Mark, let's not start that again today. Get up and get dressed, Mark. We need somebody to make the X cycle go. Mother's going to make eggs this morning, and we'll need the extra power for the ventilator. Oh, boy, eggs. Oh, Mary, big deal, eggs. Every day it's the same old thing. Get up, ride the X cycle, have school, take a nap, read, have more school. Mark? I want to go outside and play. Play? Uh, Mark, you know very well why we can't go outside and play. The next thing you know, you'll have Mary all upset. Now, get dressed. We need the X cycle to make the ventilator go over these eggs. Uh, Daddy, yesterday Mark said that the bomb was a hundred megaton that hit us. I did not. You did too. I did not. All right, all right. That's enough. Well, how big was it, Daddy? I don't know. It, it was a hundred megatons, wasn't it, Dad? No. See? On the radio, they said it was a hundred megatons. Let's not talk about the bomb. It's all right, Anne. On the radio, they said it was between 50 and 100. They didn't know for sure. They have no way of knowing. Well, did it knock down our house? Yes. And my school? Probably. How about uh, Grandpa and Grandma's house? I don't know. I think not. They're pretty far away. Uh, are Grandpa and Grandma still alive? Yeah, it's all right, Aunt. I think they're still alive, Mary. Grandpa's a pretty smart man. He could have gotten them away before the fire got to them. Well, Mark said there was nobody left alive in the world but us. Mark. I did not. You did too. Now, Mark, that was a terrible thing to say. Well, then how come we can't get anything on the radio anymore? Ed, I don't think this is a subject we ought to discuss before breakfast. I think it's better they know the truth when they ask for it, Anne. It's better than guessing about half-truths. Now, there could be any number of reasons why we can't pick up anything on the radio anymore, Mark. Maybe, maybe our antenna was destroyed by the firestorm that followed the blast. Maybe it's covered with radioactive ash. We know that most of the major cities were hit the same time ours was. Now, maybe the smaller cities don't have broadcasting stations powerful enough to reach us. It could be any number of things. But I can assure you of one thing. Somewhere, somehow, there are people left. Is, is my bicycle gone, too? Yes. And, and the swing? Oh, I knew this was going to lead to no good. Now, Mark, you march over to the X cycle and get it going. This place is getting full of smoke. Now, Mary, darling, you wash your face and get out your homework. We're going to study fractions today. And you didn't do too well last time. Ed? Yes? The children are asleep now. You gave them a pill? Mm-hmm. And their orange juice. It should be safe to talk now. What are we going to do? I don't know. I've been thinking about it. Couldn't we run for it? What do you mean? When the air gives out in here, pick up the children and run. Maybe if we run fast and long enough, maybe we could get out of it. I've thought about that, too. But the circle of radiation may be anywhere from 50 to 100 miles, depending on the size of the bomb and the wind drift. We couldn't make it in a day or two days, even if we ran. Well, can't we open the ventilators? No, no, it's still too hot out there. The exterior Geiger counter still reads more than 80 wrenches an hour. If we open the exterior ventilator an hour, it'd be as radioactive in here as it is out there. Why has it stayed so hot so long? You said that within three months it would cool down long enough for us to leave. I thought it would. But well, what's gone wrong? I don't know. Any number of things could have. Maybe we were closer to the blast than we figured we would be. Maybe we're covered with radioactive earth. It could be any number of things. Couldn't we open the door and see? No, no, it's too hot to expose the children to. It could ruin them. Just a crack? I'm afraid not. Oh, I wonder what time it is. Two o'clock. No, I mean, I wonder what time it is outside. About the same. 
We don't even know what time it is, the day of the week or anything. Yes, we do. I've kept it all marked off on the calendar. Yes, but how many times has the clock stopped? Twice? Three times? Exactly twice. Because you forgot to wind because it. Because we both forgot to wind well, it. Well, I can't do everything. Cook meals on a single burner, keep house and raise two children in a nine by twelve room. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, Ed. I didn't mean to snap at you that way. I'm just so tired of it all. It seems you try so hard and you never win. You build a fallout shelter to be safe from the bomb... And you have to worry about the firestorms that follow. Uh, so you make it completely self-contained. Water, food, air. Enough to last you six months in case the radiation's hotter than you think. Annie. And the blast knocks the fuel line loose. And all your plans go up in the air like a puff of smoke. Oh, Annie. It just isn't fair, Ed. It just isn't Annie, fair. And you've got to control yourself. I'm tired of being in control of myself. It's like a house of cards. You put one in wrong and the whole thing comes tumbling down. Annie, please. It isn't fair. It just isn't Annie. fair. Annie. Annie. Is that it? Is that the generator? No. No, that's the oxygenator. When the generator goes, everything will go. The lights, water, everything. And we, we've got to make some decisions. Listen... What? Listen, it sounds like digging. There it is. Do you hear it? Yes, I can hear it. Yes, you're right. It is digging. They found us. Somebody's trying to rescue us. And wait. They're here. We're safe. And stay away from that door. But they're here. They found us. And we have no way of knowing who's on the other side of that door. The Geiger counter says it's 80 wrenches an hour out there. A rescue crew wouldn't enter an area this hot even with protective clothing. But who else could it be? I don't know. But whoever it is, we'd better make sure before we let him in. If he's been wandering around long out there, he won't be pretty to look at. He's still at it. Whoever it is, he's kept it up over two hours. Who's out there, Dad? I don't know, Marky, but we're going to find out. Hand me that Geiger counter, son. You're not going out. No, I just want to get a radiation reading in the airlock. Here it is, Dad. Stand back at the table, Ann, and keep Mary behind you. All right, stand behind your father, Mark. There's a reading of 10 just inside the inner door. Oh, boy. It's hotter in here. 10, 20, 40 at the door. That's hot. That means it's in excess of 80 outside. Who's out there, Daddy? I don't know. Let's see if I can make him hear us. There's someone out there, all right. He hears me, but he won't answer. Who do you suppose it is? I don't know. Bill Bigler. What? Bill Bigler from over the next block. He's the only one in our neighborhood that built a fallout shelter besides us. But what would he be doing out there? He's got a Geiger counter. He knows it's too hot to be moving around out there. Food. What? Food. They've run out of food. Do you suppose? I know it is. I talked to Alice on the phone the day after they finished their shelter. She asked me how much food we were stocking, and I said enough for six months. Well, she laughed and said they were only stocking for three months. Bill said no radiation would linger beyond that, and if it did, they wouldn't want to come up to see what the world looked like. Could be. This is almost the fourth month. They could have lasted this long if they'd stretched things. I know it's them. Oh, they must be starving. We've got to help them. 
No. And they're our neighbors. We never so much as spoke to them until we built our shelters. But they're human beings. Ed, I'm warning you. Stay away from that door. Ed. My! Anne, put that rifle down. You're frightening the children. If you open that door, Ed Johnson, I swear I'll shoot you. And try to be reasonable. I am being reasonable. You can't build a shelter to protect your family from radiation and then throw it open to a total stranger. Bill Bigler is not a total stranger. He is if he's contaminated with radiation poisoning. And all I plan to do is put some food and water in the airlock. I'll open the outer door and lock the inner one. No. He, he, he can't get inside with the inner door locked. No, but the radiation can. You told me that. Not that much. Enough. You know that. Enough to hurt the children. But, Anne, those people are starving to death. Well, let them starve. Anne. Alice Bigler laughed when I told her we stockpiled enough food and water for six months. Well, let her laugh now. Anne, this is insanity. I mean what I say, Ed. Mommy, please don't. Anne. You're frightening the children. Please put the gun down. Please, Mom. Mommy, the light! Uh, wh Why did the lights go out? Mark, go get the flashlight. Uh, well, what happened, we Dad? We just run out of fuel, that's all. Will we be all right, Dad? Yes, yes, nothing's wrong. I'll take care of it. It's time to go to bed anyway. Everybody undress and hop into bed. Uh, what about the man outside? Don't worry, he can't get in. I won't let him hurt you. I'm scared. Daddy, I'm scared. Don't be, Mary. It's all right, honey. He's still at it. Yes, but he's getting weaker. What's he doing out there? It sounds like he's trying to pry the door open. Depending on how long he's been out there, he must be pretty sick. He's probably leaning against the door, vomiting. Oh, Ed, please. I'm sorry. Are the children asleep? Yes, finally. What are we going to do? I don't know. Ed, couldn't we please try and run for it? And the most distance we could cover would be 20, 30 miles. In places, the ashes would be hip deep, maybe higher. In the end, we'd, we'd wind up like him. There just wouldn't be any point in it. Couldn't we try and open the air vents? No, it's still too radioactive for that. We, we might just as well open the door. Oh, why has it stayed so hot for so long? The brochures, everything said you'd be able to leave at the end of three months, four at the most. Now, what went wrong? If I knew, Anne, I... we wouldn't be here. So many things can go wrong that you never count on. Maybe we were just too close to the blast. I don't know. How much air do you think we have left? An hour. Maybe less. What'll happen then? The oxygen in the room will be gone and... We'll start breathing our own carbon dioxide. Will it be bad? I don't know. If you're asleep, it shouldn't be bad. Certainly not as bad as being out there. Do you think we'd stay asleep through it? I was just wondering about that. If we took sleeping pills? Yes. Then I think so. Well, then that's the way I want us to go, Ed. Asleep. And all of us together. That's what I was thinking, too. I'll have to wake the children. What for? To give them a pill. I don't want either of them to wake up trying to breathe. All right, dear, but hurry. Time's running out. I'll put some food and water in the airlock. But why? You said it wouldn't do him any good. I know, I know. But maybe it'd be nice if just once before he dies... He knows the world isn't completely devoid of human beings. Hurry, Anne, the air is getting bad. Mary, Mark. Wake up, Mark. Hmm? I want you to take these. Is it time to get up yet? No, darling. Just drink this and go back to sleep. Tell me when it's time to get up. I will. Mary, Mary. Uh, well, Mother wants you to take these. What for? To help you sleep. 
I don't want any. Oh, but, Mary, they're good for you. I don't want any. Ed. Ed, I... Oh, it's I... all right. Uh, here. Give them to me. Mary, you have to take your pills, honey. We're all taking them. See? I'm taking mine. And Mommy's going to take hers. Well, what are they? Well, they're just sleeping pills so we can all go to sleep together. Will we wake up together? Yes, if... If we wake up, we'll all wake up the way we went to sleep together. Oh, I want some pills, too. Here you are, honey. Mm. Oh, good night, Mommy. Good night, Daddy. Good night, Mary. I don't want to cry. It's all right, dear. I love them both so much. I know. I love them, too. I love you all. Everything. So much. I love you, darling. I'm sorry I couldn't make it work. I tried. I tried very hard. I know. We all tried. It's not your fault. It was just a house of cards. That's all. It couldn't work. I love you, Anne. Just hold me, dear. Try to sleep. I love you all. Very much. I love you, too. Just hold me. Get those stretchers in here. Take the children first. Take the woman's pulse, Greg. She got too hysterical near the end. Three other stomachs pump, Doctor. No, they took only one sleeping pill apiece. That much will just help them sleep the whole thing off. Be careful with those children there. Would you say the experiment was a success? Yeah. A family of four in a nine by twelve fallout shelter for nine months? Yes, I'd say they did pretty well. But they lost touch with reality toward the end. You probably would have too if your only contact with reality was a radio. And suddenly that was taken away from you. But they really thought they were survivors in a fallout shelter. The last people left alive on Earth. Greg, that was the purpose of the experiment. To change the variables until you find the breaking point. Anybody can survive when everything's running smoothly, but break their communication, disrupt their fuel supply, threaten them with the unknown from without. And they did pretty well. For two months, they wouldn't mention to each other that they were losing fuel. Neither one would mention it for fear of frightening the others. They did pretty well. Then the experiment was a success. No, the experiment wasn't a success, but the people were. As long as people have to hide under the ground, all experiments are failures. But maybe we can learn how to protect the people so they can outlive the failures of experimenters. Watch that stretcher there. Be as gentle as you can. That's a human being you're carrying. presented A House of Cards, written by George Bamber and directed by Warren Somerville. In the cast, Vicki Bola, George Petrie, Bryna Rayburn, Cecil Roy, and Guy Sorrell. Audio engineers Bill Sandreuter and Marty Folia. Sound technicians Ed Blaney and M.C. Brock. Original music by Alexander Vlastatsenko. Orchestra under the direction of Glenn Osser. Executive producer for Theater 5, Edward A. Byron. We invite your comments. Write to Theater 5, Box 233, New York, New York. This is Fred Foy speaking.
It's not a bad place, really, once you've conquered the humiliation. Well, but of course, I wouldn't be here at all if it hadn't been for that ghastly dog, that Cerberus at the gates of... Yes, at the gates of hell. <laughs> this time. And remember the boom camera's on you till you hold up the bottle. And then we go to a close-up of the pills. Right you are. Keep your fingers crossed. You'll make it this time. Need better. Those clubs are costing the agency a fortune. Quiet on the set. Roll it. Roll it. Are you run down at the end of the day? Do you wonder where your pep has gone? Then what you need is tone. The amazing new product resigned to destroy your... Resigned to destroy... Cut! Good grief. I'm terribly sorry, John, old boy. These commercials are deadly tongue twisters. Not deadly enough. Fire him. Get rid of him. Find me an actor who can say his lines, not some has been. You fire him. I can't. That's Leslie Adams. I'll be glad to. I'm sorry, Mr. Adams, but I'm afraid we'll have to call it off. Apparently, you can't remember the lines. We need someone who can. Mr. Weaver, the man who could remember these lines would have to be part imbecile and part minor bird. I congratulate you on your wisdom in releasing me. I am a dramatic actor, not a pill salesman. Good afternoon. Uh, Leslie, wait a minute. I'd like to thank you, John, for your understanding commiserate with you on our mutual employer. Let's try it once more, shall we? I'm sorry, John. He's through here. Let's not perpetuate this polyglot. I know you'll get it right the next time. There won't be a next time. Our single point of agreement. Good afternoon. Listen, Weaver. I'm true. Now, Leslie, let's make a good exit. No matter who calls you back, don't turn. The scene is ended. Head high, Leslie. One more take if you leave him alone. I'm glad you did that, Leslie. No man who has played Bernard Shaw should concern himself with the small intestines. Oh, down, please. Thank you. Six weeks. Six weeks in Hollywood, and Leslie Adams is forced into a commercial. Well, a man's got to make a living. What's happened to my memory? 64 isn't old. Why can't I retain the lines? Oh, it must be this cold I've got. It's got to be, simply got to be the cold. The money's gone. Oh, where will I go, the actor's home? If only I could get through to that nephew of mine. <laughs> Bonnyface Walter. How's the hostel tonight? A welter of mail and messages? Uh, slow, Mr. Adams. No calls for you. Nothing from Alex Kendall? Not a thing. Leslie! Oh, how nice to see you again. Jamie! <laughs> Here for a film? Oh, just three weeks. Are they keeping you busy? Oh, you know, the round of television. Uh, that nephew of mine won't let me rest. Oh, yes, Alex is doing well, isn't he? Oh, yes, and gone completely Hollywood. You know. <laughs> Even his wife's got a secretary to handle their social life. <laughs> Incredible place, isn't it? Ah, uh, but I may escape it yet. Miller wants me back in his new play. Oh, Broadway? I envy you. As a matter of fact, Jamie, there's a young man in it you might play. Uh, shall I put in a word with Gilbert? Well, that's uh, always home, you then know. Then it's done. See you tomorrow. Good night. I, uh, I know it's none of my business, but is he that important on Broadway? Does he owe you a bill? As a matter of fact, I'll he... cover it. And the answer to your question is yes. Or uh, it used to be. Well, then he'd better go back. He hasn't worked since he moved in. His memory's shot. 
There's nothing for him to go back to. Hold it, buddy. Who are you? What are you doing here? I'm Leslie Adams. And? And I'm not a tourist from Boise. I'm here to see my nephew who's directing on this set. Sorry, orders are the stage is closed. Don't argue with him, Leslie. The man's too young to remember who you are. They ought to be breaking for the day soon. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I'll, I'll wait outside. Well, the days are pretty here. Weather, that is. The rest is like a visit to the dentist. It goes well enough until the drill strikes. <laughs> Leslie Adams soliciting Alex Kendall. The world turns, doesn't it? But it's only work I want, not charity. If he and Marsha would only invite me to one of those parties they give, they ask the right people, men who could give me work. Yes, they're coming out now, the actors. There is a tide in the affairs of men which, taken at the flood, leads on to fortune. What happened to my tide, my fortune? Alex was directing amateur minstrels when I played opposite Joan Crawford here. Did he leave word to put me out? Oh, come, Leslie, you're neurotic about this memory thing. It's a cool, that's all. The actor's home won't get you yet. Oh, but how the rent keeps spiraling. The banks have had it, Leslie. You're cashed out for money. An actor needs his dignity. What is he but the face he can wear? Oh, there he is. There's Alex. Hello, Alex now, make it Island, casual. Island. Don't seem to need him too much. Alex Kendall, imagine meeting you here. Leslie Adams. How are you, Uncle Les? Well, this is a pleasant surprise. Oh, I was just on my way out of John Houston's office. Oh, you got a show with him? Well, he wants me in that Roman epic with all the spears and chariots. That film will look like a hardware convention. Everybody rattling around like pots. <laughs> Oh, you're a funny man, Uncle Les. You should have been a stand-up comic. I should have been a comic? Oh, I, I didn't mean to offend you. You uh, you could have been a great success. I have been a great success. Oh, yes, you, you have. Uh, well, uh, I've been meaning to call you, Les, every day for a month now. Well, I wrote you where I was staying. I know. I've just been working so hard. They've got me directing so much TV, I'm beginning to feel like a traffic cop. That busy, eh? Yeah, it's killing me. You... Yes, it's killing me, too. Not the work, the lack of it. Oh, uh, oh I'm busy enough. Uh, Les, I'm sorry I've got to run. Shall we see each other? I hope so. When? Uh, well, look, uh, Marsha's giving one of those she-she parties next Saturday. You always hated that kind of thing. I don't suppose you'd like to come. Mm, well, that is poker night with Freddie March. Oh, too bad. Another time? Oh, what am I saying? Oh, dear. Now he's going to be in New York this weekend. And we can look for you? Well, if Houston doesn't hold me up. Oh, uh, it's black tie, Les. Oh, thank you, Walter. Nice of you to bring it up from the tailor. That, that's a beautiful jacket, Mr. Adams. Yes, yes, it should be. It was cut by the tailor to the Prince of Wales while I was in London, playing in Maytime. White for dinner was new then. The Prince and I made a vogue of it. This thing cost me 45 pounds. Oh, worth it, I'd say. The way it fits. Makes you look like a prince yourself. Thank you, Walter. Oh, uh... Take this for your trouble. Oh, oh, no, that's too much. A discerning man should be recognized. Take it, I insist, as a token of a special occasion. This is a turning point in my life, Walter. The comeback. Hollywood, twice taken. Sound the trumpet for Leslie Adams. All hail Caesar. And crown his head with laurel for the march of triumph tonight. <laughs> Where are 
There you are, driver. Keep the change. What is it about giving a big tip that makes a man feel confident? Well, there it is, Leslie. The Kendall Menage. An imposing pile of rock, isn't it? Beautiful, too, in a grandish kind of way. As I remember Marcia, she's a little grandish, too. She must hire a battery of gardeners to keep the grounds as well. Oh, well, well, that's perfect. They've got themselves a dog. Not just any dog, mind you, but a Dane. This is not just any Dane, but a Harlequin, for heaven's sake, cavorting in the sprinkler like something out of DeMille. Well, now, just stay where you are, boy. The Princess Taylor wouldn't approve of you. No, down, boy. Stop shaking. Go on, go on. You're muddy. For a man who loathes animals, he's extremely fond of me. Alex should keep him chained when there are guests. Well, Leslie, it's time to storm the castle. To carve a new career in those television films of his. It's not such a bad little medium. And you could bring quality to it. Good evening. I'm Leslie Adams. Oh, Mr. Adams, there you are. I was just passing the door. The other guests are in the drawing room. Please come in. Well, how nice to see you again. I have... Oh, no! Oh. No, no, boy. Get down. Get up. Oh, dear. Oh, look what he's done. And that mud all over my dress. Oh, what a shame. And he's darted off. Is there anything I can do? Thank you, no. If you'll introduce yourself to the other guests, I'll just go and change. Alex was held up at the studio. He may not be able to make it. Excuse me. Uh, Certainly, certainly. Oh, what an incredible performance. He's ruined her perfectly beautiful dress, and she's still going to let him stalk the house like the Hound of the Baskervilles. Well, that's Hollywood. Oh, great Jupiter, here he comes again like a wounded boar. No, 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 down, boy, down. Stay away from my jacket. Stop licking my hand. I have no desire to establish a friendship with you. Oh, and will you, for heaven's sake, stop following me? You make me nervous in this jacket. Oh, here, boy, here, 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 come. Now, let's try the patio, shall we? There. Out you go, good riddance. Yes, and don't fall in the pool. The displacement would be a disaster. Why did she call me Mr. Adams? That was chilly of her. What a shame Alex isn't here. I thought I might borrow the rent from him. What? Borrow? Oh, no, certainly not. All you want is a job, and Alex can give you one. No one stop worrying about the memory thing. The scenes are so short in film, there'll be no problem at all. All right, Leslie. Pick yourself a producer and get yourself a job. <laughs> Oh, is that a martini? Thank you. Thank you very much. You know, uh, Mr. Delbert, as I was saying, your series, your series is without question the most superior in television today. Well, thank you very much. No, no, I mean it. It's adult, imaginative, creatively conceived. Any serious artist should feel privileged to appear in it. Oh, I know I would, and I turned down parts by the score. Now, go away, boy. Go away. <laughs> that dog is crazy about you, isn't he? Yes, he seems to be. Say, do you suppose they'd mind if I put him out again? <clears throat> come on, boy. Come on. I'll be back, Mr. Bell, but I think I can be of help to you. <laughs> now, listen, you moon-eyed minotaur. You're not going to wreck my chances. I'm here on serious business. I've got to talk to these people, especially to Alex's wife. I can't have you fawning on me while I work. So, out you go. Out, do you hear me? Go on, out! Oh, heavens, here comes Marcia. Did she see me do that to him? I don't think she likes me anyway. All right, Leslie, charm her. She can persuade Alex to give you work. Talk about her house, her garden, her dog. Tell her she's beautiful. Alex can help you. And Lord, how you need it. Oh, what a way to live. You revolt me, Leslie Adams, soliciting these people like some beggar in the street. 
Well, what else can I do? Go to the actor's home. Oh, Marcia, Marcia. You know, if I'd known you'd wear such a dress as that, I wouldn't have been so stricken. <laughs> Petucci, isn't it? Or Marley Parnett? I uh, know. It was done by one of Alex's designers. Well, yeah, that's another talent of Alex's, finding the right people. A designer, an actor, a wife. He's unerring. He's perfect. He was married once before. Well, one works toward perfection, you know. Ah. <laughs> oh, I saw that show of his last Tuesday. Brilliant. Oh, it was good, wasn't it? I've been a director, too, you know. I see the inspirational touches. Alex has a transcendent talent for dramatic grouping, like, uh, well, like Goya. Oh, do you think so, too? Oh, please sit down and tell me about it. Oh, for the love of Jupiter, is he back in? Oh, dear, and covered with mud again, I do No, wish boy, you... down, down. Get oh. off that sofa, you idiot. Get off. There. Well, I hope you'll forgive me, Marcia, but it, it did seem wrong, you know, for that dog to sprawl on a velvet love seat. Yes, didn't it? Excuse me, Mr. Adams. I must see how dinner is coming along. Dear saints in heaven, I've offended her, slapping that canine pachyderm. Well, there's no time to waste. I'll get to work on Delbert again. You need a job, Leslie, in a series. You need a lot of ransom to stay out of that actor's home. <laughs> And that, said Schubert with a leer, is why we close our alley once a year. <laughs> oh, Leslie, Leslie, you're irresistible, isn't he, Marcia? Oh, yes, indeed he is. Good boy, Leslie. You've really made an impression on Delbert. I'm sure you can get work with him. Now, if you can warm Marcia up. Oh, thank goodness they put out that dog for dinner. Oh, squab. I love it. What's that? Oh, by George, there he is again, scratching at that patio door and lolling his tongue out at me. I don't really like animals. What's he moon-eyeing at me for? Oh, thank you. I'll have two of them. Doesn't she see him? It's disgraceful what she lets that dog do. Why doesn't she send him away? Ah. Oh. Oh, there he is. Well, is she just going to sit there? Everybody's embarrassed by that beast. Don't look at me, boy. Stay away. Oh, no, 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 no. Here he comes. Right under the table beside me. Why does she look at me that way? Can I help it if her fiendish dog has picked me out? Get away, boy. Get away. Get away. Stop slobbering on my jacket. I'll be a mess. Give me a chance, boy. I've got a lifetime to save tonight. Where's my dignity if you slobber all over me? Oh, yes, indeed, Mr. Delver. Uh, men of your perception are rare in television. You and Alex are rare. I said to Marcia, Alex ought to work for Delbert exclusively. <laughs> That's where the quality lies. Well, I consider myself... Stop it, boy. Stop it. Get, get away from the jacket. He doesn't Lord, how will I ever stand up? Tell if I can get this food down to him. Maybe he'll stop drooling on me. Careful, Leslie. Don't let them see you do it. Just ease the plate down to him. Maybe he'll stay off the jacket. Hungry as I am, that's more important now. Act as though you dropped something and... Get it down to the floor. There you are, boy. Oh, oh that fool dog has knocked it out of my hand. Well, don't stare at me. If you'd put the beast out in the first place, this never would have happened. He's ruined my life, filthied my jacket, deprived me of work, stolen my dignity. What chance have I now? Mr. Adams, I didn't mind about my dress. I didn't mind about the muddy sofa. But perhaps it would be better if the cook were to feed you both in the kitchen, if you insist on bringing your dog to my party. It's not a bad place, the actor's home, once you've conquered the humiliation. And there's one splendid thing about the home. No dogs allowed.
Theater 5 has presented The Big Dog, written by Richard McCracken and directed by Warren Somerville. In the cast, John Griggs, Vicky Bola, Ralph Camargo, Guy Sorrell, George Petrie, Bob Hastings, and Marty Myers. Audio engineer, Neil Pulse. Sound technician, Ed Blaney. Script editor, Jack C. Wilson. Original music by Alexander Vlasdotsenko. Orchestra under the direction of Glenn Osser. Executive producer for Theater 5, Edward A. Byron. We invite and would appreciate your comments. Write to Theater 5, New York 23, New York. This is Fred Foy speaking. This has been an ABC Radio Network production. Lou, I said to myself, He's a genius. What the theater needs is a good old-fashioned melodrama. He's a genius. The public is tired of symbolic plays where people sit in a sewer for three acts contemplating their navels. Lou, I said to myself, get yourself a real melodrama with a pretty innocent young girl and a deep-dyed villain. I tried to get the top playwrights to give me a melodrama. I got stacks of unread manuscripts by unknown writers. He's a genius. Then I found it. The play I was looking for. I entitled it He's Melodrama. And now Melodrama is the biggest hit on Broadway. He's a genius. The biggest hit of the season. The biggest hit in years. It's He's making a me a million dollars. He's a genius. Lou, I said to myself, you're a genius. <laughs> presents Melodrama. Thanks for calling, Johnny. No, I haven't found a play yet. Spread the word around that I want a real melodrama. I tell you what, I'm just leaving the office now. I'll meet you at the backstage club in 15 minutes. Hello, Mr. Darren. You're not the type. You're assuming I'm an actress. Who else comes into a producer's office, especially without knocking? Write your name down and don't call us, we'll call you. Well, have I asked you for a job? What else would you want? Uh, plenty. No, now, look, it'll take a few minutes to explain. It might even take a long time. No, it won't, because I won't listen. I have to leave now. Oh, look, you're looking for melodrama, aren't you? Uh-huh, and I don't expect to get it from any actress. Oh, oh how do I say it? Mr. Darren, I I'm desperate. Oh, I know you're used to having people say they're desperate. I know it isn't a good approach, but look, Mr. Darren, when was the last time an actress came into this office not looking for a job? Young lady, are you trying to pry into my private life? I am deadly serious, Mr. Darren. I, I want a favor, yes, but I'm not looking for a job. Please, please listen to me. What favor? Give me five minutes. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'm going to light this cigarette now, and you have until it's finished to tell me what's on your mind. All right. Oh, my goodness, I'd better talk fast. I in the first place, I'm not from New York. Actresses never are. I come from a little town upstate. I was the leading lady in the high school dramatic club, and everybody said I was good. Every leading lady in every high school dramatic club is good until she leaves home. I wish you'd stop talking and using up my time. Well, I started acting with a little theater group. A professional critic from Rochester said I was absolutely wonderful as Tina. You know, the girl who sucks her thumb throughout the two acts of Hope is a Crumpled Newspaper Blown by Vagrant Winds. All right. Four months ago, my uncle's estate was settled and I got $3,500. So you came to New York to play Ophelia. So I came to New York to play anything I could get. <sighs> but it wasn't easy. I tramped around from one producer's office to another, and I never heard a casting director say anything except, you're not the type. Everybody talks about how actresses have aching hearts, and what we really have is aching feet. Two more puffs, and I'll kill this cigarette. Oh, well, here, uh, have one of mine. <laughs> All right, one more cigarette, just because you're pretty. Fine. And for heaven's sake, Mr. Darren, don't puff so hard. <laughs> What I want to tell you about is something that started one day in the corridor right outside this office. 
I'd been waiting to see you for three hours, Mr. Darren, and finally I left. Well, a man who was also been waiting caught up with me in the corridor. He was tall and tailored, and he had blue eyes and light hair and a sandy mustache. And, well, naturally, I believed him when he said he was an actor because he had an English accent. I beg your pardon, miss. Oh, yes? I gather we're fellow thespians. I'm looking for a job as an actress, if that's what you mean. I gather that. You may have wondered why I was hanging about so long in Lou Darren's office. Well, I suppose you were looking for a job just like me. Oh, my goodness, no. Lou and I are old friends. Perhaps it isn't modest, but it's a simple statement of fact that I don't have to beg for jobs in the theater. As a matter of fact, I'm Dick Appleton. Oh. Is that so? Yes. To tell you the truth, I was studying you there in Lou's office. I believe you may be exactly the type I'm looking for. For what? For lunch, to start with. Mr. Appleton, I'm not in the house. Oh, please, I don't want you to misconstrue my motives. Fact is, I'm engaged in a theatrical venture. That's all I can tell you now. But if we have lunch together, if we talk together for an hour or so, I'll know by the end of that time whether you're the young, fresh talent that I'm looking for. You mean to act on the stage? Exactly. Lunch. Lunch? <laughs> good lunch. And I found Dick Appleton very easy to talk to. Mostly because what we talked about was me. But by the end of the lunch, I still had no inkling as to whether he was pleased with me or not. Over coffee, though. Well, you are an interesting person, Miss Biddle. What I don't see is how you managed to live here in New York. Well, I do have a little money. Oh? Yes, but it's discouraging when no producer seems to take me seriously. Yes, of course. Uh, I don't suppose you have much money. Mm, my uncle left me $3,500. You know, I, I was wondering whether I ought to go to a dramatic school. Oh, I doubt that you need to... $3,500, you said? Mm-hmm. Well, I don't suppose there's much of that left. Oh, about 2500 Ah, 2500 Then you can sustain yourself during the rehearsal period. Would you say that again? Oh, sorry, my dear girl. Here we are. I've been talking for an hour, and it's obvious to me that you're enormously talented. Golly. You have incandescence. Oh, I've seen that word in drama reviews. You have luminosity. I have? Indeed, you certainly have. Now, let's get down to business. I'm associated in the production of a new play by... Well, I'm not at liberty to say who the playwright is yet. Oh, of course. But he is one of our rarely fine modern playwrights. The play is symbolic. It's all about a girl surrounded with abnormal uncles and aunts, cousins and brothers and sisters, you know, who runs away to find sanity by living in a sandbox. Oh, oh, the sandbox is symbolic. I knew you had a quick mind. And the writing itself, stark, almost incoherent. Oh, it sounds wonderful. Oh, it is. I'm sure it'll run two years. Now then, I want you to play the girl. The lead? The lead. But I don't want to unveil you to my associates until I've coached you for some time. Oh, I'll do anything you say. Splendid. Now, I have a small apartment here in the city. I live in Bucks County, actually. Now, if you'd come to that apartment each day... Starting when? Starting now. Let's go. For two weeks, I rehearsed in that apartment. Mr. Darren, you have no idea how exciting and demanding he was. Well, sometimes he'd have me read one line over and over again, different ways for an hour. Oh, he seemed to know an awful lot about acting. Wait a minute. My cigarette's out. I, I know. I noticed. But I hope you're going to listen to the rest of it. I am, yes, and I'll tell you why. This man said he was a good friend of mine. Yes. I don't know anybody named Dick Appleton. I'm not surprised. He acted as if he were well-known in the theater. I can say with authority that there's no Dick Appleton in the theater. I'm not surprised at that either. Who was this guy? Will I go on? Yes. Well, as I say, he rehearsed me hard for two weeks. He criticized my walk, corrected my diction, told me that all my life I had been sitting down and standing up without really knowing how to do these things. Well, then one day when I arrived at the apartment... Oh... Hello, Mary. Good morning. Uh, come in, won't you? Right. Well, 
Shall we start? Uh, ready, Mary, I don't know. What's the matter? I just don't know how to tell you this. Oh, dear, something's terribly wrong. It certainly is. Here, I've made you put in your time here for two weeks. Really, I feel I ought to pay you for it. I don't understand. You know what an angel is, of course. Oh, sure, the backer of a play, the man who puts up the money. Well, that's one way of saying it. My way of saying it this morning is that an angel is a devil. Well, I, I think you'd better explain. Uh, sit down, won't you? All right. Now, naturally, I have a backup for this play we've been rehearsing. I've put in a good deal of my own money, but I did need the backer's money, too. Now, the playwright trusts me implicitly. And when I told him about you, he said he'd take my word for your talent. But the backer... I see. The backer doesn't want me? The backer insists on a big-name star. Oh, dear. Either I agree to cast a star, in which case you don't get the part, or I insist on you, in which case the play doesn't go on. There isn't any other way of getting the money? Not quickly enough, no. Oh, wait a minute. If I sold my telephone company... I should... know. Oh, I'd almost make it, but we'd still need another $2,000. Oh. 2000 But I have $2,000. Oh, no, 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 Mary. I couldn't take it Look, away. Look, there isn't anything wrong with an actress investing in a play, is there? Well, no. It's done all the time, of course. Especially when the actress is going to star in the play. Well, then... No, oh, Mary, I hate to do But this. don't you see? You're doing me a favor. Well... Look, when do you need the money? Well, as a matter of fact, dear, yeah, right away... I have to put a deposit down right, for the right. theater. Now, now, you stay right there. I'm going to go down to the bank. And I'll be back in 15 minutes with $2,000. I ran all the way to the bank. And then all the way back. And when I gave Dick Appleton the $2,000, it was wonderful to see how happy he was. Oh, wonderful, Mary. Let me kiss you. Mm. No rehearsing today, Mary. Go on home, take a nap, and dream about opening night. He didn't have to tell me to dream about opening night. I did nothing else from then until the next morning when I returned to his apartment. I knew, or at any rate I thought, that yesterday he had put down the deposit on the theater. Oh, I was so excited. I was an actress. I was going to be a star. Well, when he didn't answer my knock, I tried the door. It opened. So I, I walked in. The apartment was vacant. All the furniture was gone. Dick Appleton was gone. And my money was gone. Well, Miss Biddle, that's a very interesting story, but I don't see what it has to do with me. Mr. Darren, the story is not finished yet. You said you were going to ask me a favor. That's right. What is it? Well, you'll have to hear the whole story first. I'm overdue at the backstage club. You haven't been interested in what I've been telling you? I've been very much interested. But when somebody wants a favor and tells me a long story, finally ending with the information that her money is gone, I get suspicious. Ah, uh -huh. you're afraid I'm going to ask you for money. That's exactly what I'm afraid of. Well, I won't keep you in suspense about that. I am going to ask you for money. It's time for me to leave for the back Look, the, the rest of the story doesn't take long. And I can assure you that you're going to want to give me money when I'm finished. Is this some kind of blackmail? No. Oh, well. I'll admit you've got me interested. Go ahead. Well, I was left with less than $500. And you can't live long on that amount in New York. Of course, I tried to locate Richard Appleton. But the police told me there was no such person in Equity or the League of New York Theaters or in the Bucks County Telephone Book. I don't suppose Appleton was his real name anyway. He was gone with my money, and I didn't think I'd ever see him again. But then, just this morning, I went into a cafeteria on 23rd Street, and there he was, sitting alone at a table, having breakfast. He didn't see me until I'd taken a seat opposite him. Excuse me, here, let me get that tray out of your way, miss. Oh. Oh. How do you do, Dick? I beg your pardon? I'd like my money back. I'm afraid there must be some mistake. We can start with the fact that you called me uh, Dick, wasn't it? Actually, my name is uh, Mortimer. Mm-hmm. 
I don't imagine your name is Mortimer any more than it is Dick, and I don't care what your name is. I want my money. Say, Miss, are you quite sure you're all right? Perhaps I should call a doctor or... A... Uh, perhaps I should call a policeman. Really, I don't know what this is all about, but by all means, let's untangle it, shall we? If you're looking for a policeman, there's one over there. Oh, where? Right behind you. Oh, well, then... I... Stop! Thief! Stop! Stop that man! Stop! Thief! Oh, of course he had tricked me. There wasn't any policeman there. He was just getting me to turn around. And now, there he was, running away from me, and I was screaming at the top of my lungs. But you know what New York is like. As soon as I screamed, stop, thief, everybody in that cafeteria hunched over their coffee and pretended not to hear me. So I had to chase Dick Appleton myself. Well, he knew I was after him. He ran down the street, turned the corner, but he never got very far ahead of me. I didn't waste my breath. I knew no one would help me. Well, he turned another corner, and when I reached it, I was just in time to see him running up the steps of a brownstone house. And I pounded up the stairs after him. The nameplates on the doorbell revealed only one with the initials R.A., Roger Amster, and 2B. Well, I took a chance, and I went to 2B. Yes, who is it? Exterminator. Oh, good. Oh. I, uh, think I'm in better condition than you are, Mr. Appleton. Hamster, hamster, or whatever it is, I... If you want to start running again, I, I can chase you all over town, but sooner or later you'll have to give me my money. Well, I guess the jig is up, eh? Why don't you come in? No, thank you. Look, if the money is in this room, please go get it and bring it here to the door. If you have to go out to the bank for it, I shall go with you. And if I've spent it? If you've spent it, you'll go with me to the police. Look, Betty, you may be able to outrun me. But really, I am taller and stronger than you are. Ow! Now, what are you going to do? Well, I'm going to walk right past you and out of here. I think not. Now, listen, you let me go. To the police. Do I look like an idiot? I'm leaving. Are you real? Oh, yes, I... Oh, you... You wouldn't. Rather a pretty little knife, isn't it? Oh, no. no. Very sharp, too. Quite valuable. Not merely because it has a jeweled handle. Oh, you wouldn't dare use that knife. I'm afraid that's only your opinion. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm getting out of here. Oh, no. No, no. Stop it. No. Stop it. Oh, oh my God. Are you trying to tell me you killed him? Yes, Mr. Darren. When was this? I told you. This morning. This morning? Wait a minute. How do you know he's dead? Well, I, I, uh, I, I didn't leave right away. I uh, examined him. Do you want me to go into detail? No. Look, if he'd been alive, I would have called an ambulance. What have you been doing since this morning? I've been... I've been walking around the city trying to think what I should do. And anyway, around... Two o'clock this afternoon, I, I called the police, and I told them a man had been murdered and where they could find the body. You didn't tell them who you were? No, not then, but, but I'm going to. Uh, when I leave here, I'm, I'm going right to the police station. I've never heard of anything like this. I'm sure you haven't. But why did you come here? What have I got to do with you or, or with that Appleton or whatever his name is? I told you I had a favor to ask of you. You told me more than that. You said you were going to ask for money and that I'd give it to you. Well, I won't. Won't? Not even when it means hundreds of thousands of dollars in your pocket for a relatively small investment? What are you talking about? Mr. Darren, you've been looking for a melodrama. And I need money for my defense. Now, haven't I given you a good plot for a melodrama? And isn't that worth the money to you that my lawyer will ask? Uh, well, well, you're going too fast for me. Look, I don't claim I've told you the whole play. But what happened today brings us up to a good first act ending. Mr. Darren, at the end of the first act, the girl comes to the producer and asks for money, just as I've asked money from you, for the defense. Hmm. It's not a bad first act. All right. Now, suppose the producer helps her. 
Suppose you shielded me, hid me, while the police were looking for me, while you were looking for proof that I did it in self-defense. I think you've got something. Listen... There's a playwright I know, and if I can get him on the phone, he'll be over here in half an hour, and you tell him everything you've uh, told that, me. That uh, won't be necessary, Mr. Darren. Huh? Mr. Darren, you have been trying to get every big playwright in town to write you a melodrama, is that right? Yeah. But you ought to know that nowadays, big-name playwrights are interested only in one thing, in those plays about girls who suck their thumbs or sit in sandboxes. Mr. Darren, would you please tell me why you never read your unsolicited manuscripts from unknown playwrights? What are you talking about? Uh, just a minute. Is that your pile of unsolicited scripts? Excuse me a minute. All right, now let's see. Ah, here it is. Now, here is the play you've had in your office for exactly four months, Mr. Darren. You've apparently never read it, but you know something? Just now, you found the first act awfully interesting. Melodrama, a play in three acts. By Mary Biddle. That's me. It'll make you a million dollars, Mr. Darren. It'll make you a genius. Presented melodrama written by Robert Sanadella and directed by Ted Bell. In the cast, Rosemary Rice, George Petrie, and Lon Clark. Audio engineer Bill Sandreuter, sound technician Ed Blaney. Story editor Jack C. Wilson. Original music by Alexander Vlastotsenko. Orchestra under the direction of Glenn Osser. Executive producer for Theater 5, Edward A. Byron. We invite and will appreciate your comments. Please write to Theater 5, New York, 23, New York. This is Fred Foy speaking. This has been an ABC Radio Network production. Theater 5 presents Mr. Bernard Grant in Skeleton. No, now look, you know why you can't spend the money. Yeah, but... Hey, I'll call you back. Somebody's at the door. Now, now sit tight, okay? All right, all right. So long. Joseph Hanlon? Yeah? I knew I'd find you here. What do you want? Now, now, is that any way to welcome anyone who's been looking for you as long as I have? Hmm? I don't know you. My, uh... Foot's in the door, Mr. Hanlon. Are you trying to break it? I will if you keep it there. Naughty, naughty. Uh, oh, you can't push your way in here. Oh, thank you for asking me. Well, what do you want? Since you insist, rye, please. Oh, now look On you... the rocks. I better make it a double. This storm has chilled me to the bone. Oh, you've got your nerve buster. Shoving your way in here to man it. Look, I don't know you. Don't you really? No. Then why are you trembling? Well, I... Add a dash of bitters, would you? Well, hurry up, man. I'm frozen. Here. Better pour one for yourself, Mr. Henman. I don't want to drink. I think you're going to need one. Look, I just want you to get out of here. Cheers. Hmm. Very good. All right, stop stalling. Now, what do you want and who are you? You really don't know who I am. Never seen you before in my life. Yes. Now, why would any man search for you as long as I had, Mr. Hen? How should I know? Then I'll help you remember. Think back a bit, my friend. Think back to a nasty episode in your life. One you thought was finished, over and done with. No. No, it, but as you see, Joseph, it is not finished at all. 
is it? I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know, I tell you. Oh, come on, Joseph. You know what you did, and so do I. Now, look, if, if it's about the girl, it, it wasn't my fault. I didn't do it. <laughs> no, it wasn't you. No, I swear it wasn't. Jenks did it, not me. Really, how curious he says that he didn't do it either, that it was you. Well, he's a liar. He's lying, I tell you. You'd better be able to prove it, Joseph. Now, look, grabbing Katie Shaw was his idea in the first place. I swear it was. But you went along with it, didn't you? Well, we didn't mean to hurt her. Oh, didn't you? Honest, we didn't. Especially after old man promised the ransom money. And why did it happen? Look, we had her locked up in the cellar, see? Well, she tried to escape. Jenks caught her getting out the window, and he yelled at her to stop. And she just jumped and ran. And so he took a shot at her to scare her, only... Only he, he didn't miss. Oh. And, of course, it was Jenks who fired that shot, not you. I swear, mister. I don't even own a gun. Jenks, it was his gun. On your word as a gentleman? But you've got to believe me. That's how it happened. It's a truth. So help me. All right. So you weren't the one who killed Katie. You still kidnapped her. Yeah, If but... you hadn't put your filthy hands on her, Katie would be alive today, wouldn't she? But I never thought... No, you didn't, did you? All you thought about was the money. The lousy money. <laughs> and Katie had to die because of your greed. I ain't slept good since, honest. That's a great help to Katie, isn't it? And to me... Who are you, buddy? Was Katie Shaw your girl? Oh, was Katie Shaw my girl? Oh. oh, no. No, she wasn't just my girl. She was my whole world. We were going to be married. We were going to spend our whole life together. Sorry, I'm sorry. Sure you are. Afterwards. Everybody's sorry. Afterwards. Hey. How did you find out about me? I mean... What's the difference? Is that going to bring Katie back to life? Well, no, but... Hey. Did Jenks put you under me? Did you think he wouldn't? Oh, that... The jerk. rats are all alike. You'd sell out your own grandmother to save your miserable skin. Well, it isn't fair to pin a rap on me. I wasn't the guy that killed her. Did Katie... suffer much before? Uh, no, no, mister. She, she went quick, honest. Did she... say anything? Did she... Did she give you any message for me? No, I... Well, I mean... Well, yeah, maybe sort of. Well, what did, you, what, what, what did she say? Well, uh, she said to, to tell you that she... Uh, that she loved you. And for you not to be too mad, because we really didn't mean to kill You're her. You're a liar! No, no, no. You're a liar! I, I swear she said it! You're oh, going, Charlie, you're choking me! You make my hands dirty! Now, wait, wait a minute, mister, please! Have a heart. You had a heart, didn't you? Look, you I'll do anything you want. Were a stranger to me. I'd never done anything to you. Yet you took away the most valuable thing in my life. And like a monster, you killed it. Please, mister, give me a chance. Like you gave Katie a chance? Oh, I wish to heaven I had. If I only have another chance now to grab Jenks' arm when he shot at us. Oh, you're bringing tears to my eyes. You had your chance, you rat. And you didn't take it. Did you? Did you? I said, did you? What are you, what are you going to do? I'm not sure. Yet. I came here to kill you, Joseph. Maybe I just ought to turn you over to the police. Oh, no, mister, don't do that. Oh, I thought you wanted to make a man. Oh, yeah, the, the cops... Then you were lying to me, John. Oh, not the cops, mister. Please, they'll burn me. I'll burn. No, oh, that wouldn't be good, would it? <laughs> oh, no, no. Thanks, mister. Thanks. No. And I wouldn't get to see you die myself, would I? Oh, oh please. I wouldn't get to see your blood run out the way Katie's did. Oh, give me a break, mister. I sure I will. With this... I sharpened it this morning, especially for you. I... Don't come at me with that thing. Are you afraid to die, Joseph? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I am. Maybe now you know what it feels like, hmm? I'll tell you. Oh, Katie, 
Are you watching me? I am not. And you're out of your mind, Mr. Say your prayers, Joseph. Get back. Get in there, away from Why don't you scream for help, Joseph? Like Katie did. Go ahead. Huh? Wouldn't do. Would it, Joseph? Not for a man who's wanted for kidnapping and murder. Oh, let it go, please. Let oh, it go. Katie, darling, here he comes. Here comes the man who took you from me, Katie. Oh, mother of mercy, no. No. That knife away from me, please. All right. Give me back, Katie. I can't give you back a dead girl. But you kidnapped her. You and Jenks killed her, didn't you? We didn't mean to. I told you. That's where we're different, see? I mean to kill you. It'll make me feel good. All right. All right, go ahead. I never... I never thought I'd feel this way. But I'll enjoy killing you, Joseph. I'll enjoy listening to you scream <laughs> until you die. Like Katie. I... Kill me. Go on. Get it over with. <laughs> but killing you wouldn't bring Katie back to me, would it? No matter what I do, I'll never be able to hold her again. Oh, kiss her. <laughs> Thanks for putting that knife away, mister. <laughs> Killing you can't undo the harm you've done to me. No, it, it can't. All right, get your coat. My coat? We're going to the police. I thought, did you think I'd let you go scot free? After hunting you down to kill you. But you said yourself it ain't going to bring Katie back if I die. Now, what good is it to you if I burn, mister? What good, huh? You're still the man who destroyed my future. Oh, give me a chance to square things, will you? There are ways. What of... ways? Well, I, I could. Well, I. Pay a fine for what I did. To you. you. You know what I mean? A fine? What are you talking about? Look, I admit I did wrong. But all I can do now is pay for it. Make it up to you. Are you trying to bribe me? With, with, with a price for Katie's life? Oh, no, no, I didn't mean it like then that. Then what do you mean? Well, conscience money, maybe. Oh, oh, conscience money. Do you think you can buy forgiveness with money? Oh, not buy, exactly. And, and I wouldn't expect you to forgive me. What would you expect? You'd expect to save your skin for a few dollars? I'm willing to pay all I can. Out of, out of my share of the ransom money. Now, Jenks got most oh, of it. Oh, sure he did. I swear, mister. I, I was just helping him. I, I didn't want to be in on it. The whole thing was his job all the way. So you want me to bother revenge for cash? Is that it? You can't spend revenge. Now, look. A guy dead... Is, is good for nothing, right? But if you can punish him with a fine, you've got your revenge and, and something else besides, right? Oh, right. So what, what did you say? As one practical man of the world to another? Yeah, yeah, that's what I mean. Now, money isn't everything, but well, it dries a lot of tears, huh? Yes, Joseph. <laughs> I suppose it does. Maybe all my tears weren't for Katie herself. Her father had promised us a very nice wedding present. Twenty thousand dollars. That's a lot of dough. No wonder. No wonder. I'm so furious at you for killing her. Is that what you're thinking? That's a lot of dough. Yes. This may be a right. Maybe that was the real reason I felt like killing you. And still do. But I, I can't offer you that kind of money. But, uh, well... Uh, how about half a grand? Speak English. Five hundred. All cash. I, I got it right here. Is that what you think your life is worth? Seven hundred? I'm still hoping you'll force me to kill you. No, don't take that knife out again. All, 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 right, all right. A grand. But that's it. I, I ain't got no more. All right. Get it. Sure, sure. Right away. Uh, 
Uh, here's the grab. You want to count it? No. I trust you, Joseph. Oh, thanks. Now, if it's all there, you're rid of Katie and me for good. If it isn't, I'll be back to kill you. Oh, it's all there, I swear. Count it. All right. All right, you can sleep peacefully now, friend. I bought your guilt. The crime against Katie is mine now. All mine. Now, remember, we, we, we made a bargain. No going to the cops. Oh, you have my word. Good night, Joseph. Good night. Uh, mister? American, I want to reserve two seats on your next flight to Mexico City. 10.40? Okay. Oh, uh, for, uh, John Jones and, uh, Tom Smith. Yeah. Huh? Any objections, Mr. Janitor? Uh, not if you got another ten spot. You mean like this? <sighs> yeah. Now, uh, you want three more names of bachelors who live alone in the building, huh? Why, you are positively clairvoyant. Yeah. What do you want all them names for, mister? I'm selling sewing kits. Ha, ha. You took my money, Mr. Janitor. I'm a custodian, mister. Pardon me. Mr. Custodian. All right. Try Sam Cooper. He's in 7B. And uh, Maurice Ball. He's in 3N. And uh, Harold Kent. In uh, 6K. <laughs> Yeah? I knew I'd find you here. Hey, who are you? What do you want? I've been looking for you for a long time, you know. I never saw you before in my life. My foot's in the door, Mr. Cooper. Are you trying to break it? Hey, get out of here. I'll call a cop. No, no, you won't. You've got too much to lose, Mr. Cooper. What are you talking about? You know, Mr. Cooper... Now, why do you suppose any man would search for you as long as I have? I don't know. Let me help you remember. Think back a bit, my friend. Think back to a nasty episode in your life. One you thought was finished. Over and done with. No. Oh, no. No, it isn't possible. But it is, you see. Your past has caught up with you, Mr. Cooper. Hey, hey look, I, I didn't know she was married. I swear I didn't. It was only when it was too late that she said anything about a husband and kids. I swear to you, mister, I didn't have the faintest idea. I didn't wake you, honey. Oh, terrific. Fish are biting like mad today. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I did five scenes, all in one apartment house. <laughs> oh, solid, sweetheart. Skeletons rattle like mad right out of the closets. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, a thousand in cash from a real live one. Four hundred more in checks. What? 
<laughs> no. No. I... Well, not bad for a couple of hours' work. Sure, we're celebrating. Phone the storm for reservations. We're spinning up a storm tonight. Oh, now, sweetheart, will you get over that piggy bank complex? Now, look. We've got it made. There's a solid gold skeleton in every guy's closet. And I know just how to rattle it. You know that guy you put onto me? Oh, come on. You know who I mean. Stop snowing me, pal. You mean you didn't think on me? <laughs> what do you know? This guy pulled a knife on me, and I, I bought him off with a grand of the ransom money. Well, certainly I know the cops are watching for the bill numbers. Why do you think I told you to cool the money? All right. Uh, look, look, listen, will you? Pack fast and meet me at the Inter-American Terminal. We're cutting out for Mexico City. Yeah. Let that blackmailing rat explain to the cops why he's spending the ransom dough. <laughs> <laughs> Theater 5, four and a half hours of dramatic radio theater continues after Weekend West coming up in just a moment here on Radio 81. Theater 5 has presented Skeleton, starring Mr. Bernard Grant. Written by Jules Archer, directed by Warren Somerville. Featured in the cast, Stan Watt, Arthur Cole, and Peter Rattray. Script editor, Jack C. Wilson. Original music by Alexander Vlasdotsenko. Orchestra under the direction of Glenn Osser. Executive producer for Theater 5, Mr. Lee Bowman. We invite your comments. Write to Theater 5, New York 23, New York. That's Theater 5, New York 23, New York. Why wasn't this news released? Because it would create public hysteria. There would be an absolute panic. Yes, I, I suppose you're right. There'd be riots in the streets. It would make an invasion from Mars seem like a Sunday school picnic. <laughs> presents The New Order. Come into my office, gentlemen. Oh, thank you, Mr. Gardner. Thank you. I'm John Clements, and this is my assistant, Sam Winston. How do you do? As you know, we're from the National Board. And what can we at Robots Unlimited do for you? Well, of course, you're aware that there's a new investigation of robotry. <laughs> there's always a new investigation of robots and Robots Unlimited, gentlemen. I just hope I haven't accidentally broken the rules of the charter. No, no, nothing like that. In fact, we wish all government departments were run as efficiently as this one. Well, thank you. Actually, we're here, Mr. Garson, because people are, well, they're getting very worried about robotry. Worried? It goes even deeper than that. They're afraid of the newest robot. But there's no reason to fear robots. I doubt we can convince people of that. At one time, a robot was a mechanical man with flashing lights for eyes, antennae for ears, and, well, he was obviously a robot. But now you can't tell a mechanical man from a human, except through dissection. No, there is another way, gentlemen. A robot is different from a human being because it does not know how to hate. And most important, it cannot bring harm to any human. Now, this is an integral part of the robot makeup. In fact, it's the first law of 
robotics. And that's precisely why we're here, Mr. Oh, excuse me. Yes, Garson here. Mr. Garson, Adam C. is ready for testing. Have Adam C. wait, please. Yes, sir. Gentlemen, would you like to see an interesting test? What kind of test? Well, Adam C. is an R4 robot. I thought all R4s were supposed to be destroyed. Yes, that is the charter states that when a robot type becomes obsolete, it should be destroyed. Why hasn't that been done? Well, the charter also gives a time limit for possible modification. So I've been working on the R4s. You see, there are two basic differences between the R4s and the R5s. The R4 voice was metallic and it had a sort of built-in echo. But the R5 voice is as human as yours or mine. The other difference is, well, I'll call it the nervous system, connecting the brain to the voice box. Well, in the R4, the working of the brain was not attuned to the voice box. The R4 could solve problems, but could not transmit the answers vocally. This, of course, made the R4 a worker with a very limited capacity and range. The R5, however, solves problems and then gives the answers. Or it transmits the answers into action, just as a human would. And have you managed to alter the R4 enough to meet the new specifications? Yes, yes. Adam C. will be the 15th XR4 I've tested. The others have all met the new specifications. According to the terms of the charter, if Adam C. passes his tests, I'll have the right to modify all other R4s. There's a total of 528 of them. Well, gentlemen, would you like to see the test? Yes, I would. And so would I. Good. I'm sure you'll find it quite absorbing. Oh, please send Adam C. in. Yes, Mr. Garson. Oh, gentlemen, would you like a cigarette? Oh, thank you. No, thanks. I'm, uh, I'm going to introduce you to Adam C. as I would a, a human. I, I ask you to cooperate. Are you trying to tell us that robots have feelings? Well, not as we know feelings, no. But their tuning can be upset by, well, unexpected rudeness, for example. Oh, come in. Adam C. reporting as ordered, Mr. Garson. Oh, Adam C. This is Mr. Clements and Mr. Winston. They are government investigators. I'm honored to know you, gentlemen. Uh... Uh, how do you do? Pleased to meet you. Now, Adam C.? Yes, Mr. Garson. Do you understand why you're here? Yes, sir. Tell me, please. I was an R4 robot. You have had me modified to meet the specifications of the R5 robot. If I do not meet all the specifications, I will be destroyed along with all other R4 robots. All right. Now, the first test is memory retention. Now, I'm going to open this book. You will read the page on the right-hand side. You will have only three seconds. Ready? Yes, Mr. Garson. Start reading. All right. Now. Adam C., in your opinion, what kind of book is this? It seems to be a work of fiction. Now, be more specific, please. I cannot be more specific, Mr. Garson. It seems to be a work of fiction. However, it could also be a biography, or it could be history done in a fictional style. Very good. And now I want you to read from memory... The 19th and 20th lines on that particular page. The lines are a piece of dialogue. Quote, I don't like the idea of Ferguson and Martin meeting as equals, Kramer declared, adding in a low voice, their ideologies are simply not compatible. Unquote. Fine. And now, gentlemen, would you like to see the page? Yes. All right. Now, here's the book, Mr. Clements. Page 47. Oh, thank you. Oh, let's see. That's right. Count down to the 19th line. I think you'll find that Adam C. read word for word that line and the one that followed. Huh. You know, this is amazing. It's not just amazing, it's completely incredible. Incredible? No, no, Mr. Winston. You see, the robot brain is uncluttered with irrelevancies. What's the next test, Mr. Garson? Mental arithmetic. Uh, may I give Adam C. the problem? Oh, by all means, please do. Um, can I have that piece of blank paper on your desk? Oh, sure. There you are. Thank you. Adam C.? Yes, Mr. Clements. I want you to solve this arithmetic problem for me. Yes, sir. Uh, multiply 7,927 by 4,684. And then I want you to divide the total by 424. That is the problem, Mr. Clements? Yes. 
The answer is 87,570, plus the fraction 97,106. <laughs> well, Mr. Clements, I, uh, I haven't figured it out for myself yet. Well, I'm sure you'll find that Adam C.'s answer is correct. Well, here's the total of the multiplication. 37,130,068. Correct, Mr. Clements. You, uh, you can prove the answer quite simply about Yes, that. yes, I know how, Mr. Garson. Well, Adam C., if Mr. Clements finds your answer to be correct, you may return to the waiting room for further instruction. Yes, Mr. Garson. Uh, well, the answer is correct, all right. That'll be all, Adam C. Goodbye, Mr. Garson. Gentlemen, being with you has been a pleasure. Well, I'll be darned. It makes one feel rather inferior, doesn't it? Uh, Mr. Garson, before this uh, test, we were speaking about the first law of robotics. Oh, yes, yes, so we were. Well, I think we're all aware of the fact that without this safeguard of the first law, Robots Unlimited would never have been granted a charter. In fact, the manufacture of human-type robots would not have been permitted. That's true. However, there is one man who can alter this first law. Professor Albert Dean, inventor of the human-type robot. And Professor Dean has been missing for the past five days. Missing? He disappeared from his home five days ago. Why wasn't this news released? Because the newspapers would pull out all the stops. There'd be panic. For the same reason, we didn't release another fact. That Professor Dean had been experimenting with a new robot. One to which the first law of robotics does not apply. You could imagine what the newspapers would do with that. Yes. This new robot type, did you know that Professor Dean was working on it? Well, yes, I did. I, well, at least there was a rumor to that effect. Mm, and uh, did you approve? Well, it makes small difference how I felt, Mr. Clemens. The matter was out of my hand. Professor Dean wasn't and isn't. Under my supervision. Yes, well, that's true enough. He was our responsibility. Mr. Garson, you were selected as general manager of Robots Unlimited because of your excellent record in government service. Your background of loyalty is impeccable. Thank you, but what is it you're trying to say, Mr. Clemens? We're expecting that you cooperate with us in this matter. Well, of course. Just tell me what it is that you want me to do. Well, at the moment, Winston and I would like the run of this building and the ground. Very well. Feel free to go anywhere. Then, later on today, we'll probably have another talk with you. Anytime at all. Good. I don't think I have to tell you how important it is that we find Professor Dean as soon as possible. Now, that's rather obvious, Mr. Clemens. The professor's knowledge of robotics can be a very dangerous thing. If, for instance, you were kidnapped by a foreign power. Exactly. Well, thank you for everything. Uh, gentlemen, if there's anything else that you need, just let me know. We will, and uh, thanks again. Thank you. Garson here calling Frank B. This is Frank B., Mr. Garson. Did you monitor my conversation with the government investigators? Yes, sir. Do you have any orders concerning them? Just this. Cooperate with them in every way, but watch them carefully. Very carefully. Provided you with a guide. I 
just wanted to have a look around. But you could get lost in this maze of passages. What's that? What? They're tapping. Tapping? There it is again. It's coming from behind this wall. Mr. Garson, there's someone behind this wall. Oh, I'm sorry you felt you had to come down here, Mr. Clemens. I insist that you... There's no need to insist. There are rooms behind this wall. How do we get to them? Simply by moving this panel. It's a cell. (laughs) Who's that? Come along, Mr. Clements. Meet Professor D. As you can see, the professor is unharmed. Why do you have him tied and gagged? Because he knows certain words that activate the robot. Oh. Here they come now. Mr. Garson, I insist that you release Professor Dean. I'm sorry. No. I order you to. Come now. Put away that gun. What do you want us to do, Mr. Garson? Take Mr. Clements to a cell. No. No, they can't carry out that order. Why not, Mr. Clements? Because of the first law of robotics. Robots aren't permitted to harm humans. But they don't intend to harm you. Hey, let me go. See? They're gentle, but very strong. Take him away, please. You... I have a good answer for all this, Carson. Well, I think I do. Yes, Professor Dean. Oh, believe me, we don't enjoy keeping you prisoner. And we'll set you free just as soon as you change your mind. Oh, no. No. Well, I'm a patient man, Professor. The emergency alarm. Mr. Garson... Please come to your office. Yes, Frank B., what is it? We found Agent Winston in the file room. How did he get in there? It must have happened while you were downstairs with Mr. Clements. I detailed some R5s to help you. There was a mistake in the assignments, and the file room was left unguarded for a moment. He must have slipped in. Where is he now? In the waiting room. Mr. Garson, I think you better tell these robot friends of yours to let me go. I'm afraid that's not possible, Mr. Winston. Now look, the kid gloves are off. I suggest that you cooperate and tell us all you know. It'll go a lot easier with you. You see, I had a good look through your file. So? I found a lot of information on Professor Dean, incidentally. Uh, do we have to speak in front of these robots? Why? Do they make you nervous, Mr. Winston? Yes, they do. Why? Have you forgotten the first law of robotics? They can't harm you. However, if you insist, I'll ask them to leave. Oh, Frank B., if you don't mind. Not at all, Mr. Garson. We'll go. Now, Mr. Winston, we were speaking about Professor Dean in the files. Please go on. After I read through certain papers in the files, it looked to me like a fantastic plot was taking form. A plot? Against our government in particular and against humanity in general. Well, that is fantastic, Mr. Wilson. Oh, please don't act so charmingly coy, Mr. Garson. You're part of it. You've got to be. How could Robots Unlimited be plotting against the government? Our our fives are unable to harm humans. Well, the first law of robotics is an inherent part of their makeup. And don't forget, if we were using robots to overthrow the government, well, we'd have the army to contend with. The first law would operate against them. Mm-hmm. That's what you want people to think. Yes, the R5s obey the first law. And while the first law applies, you can't carry out your plan. That's where Professor Dean comes in. Oh? The professor was working on a new robot model when he disappeared. A model that does not obey the first law. A robot that would carry out an order to kill. Ah, now we begin to see the ramifications of this fantastic plot. You have 800 R5s and more than 500 R4s that you're modifying. Now, that doesn't take into account the robots you're probably manufacturing in secret. In secret? Oh, you didn't see that in the files. Well, I saw enough to put you on trial for treason. If I'm to be executed as a traitor, why should I help you? I told you. We could make it easier for you. <laughs> By we, I assume you mean Mr. Clements and yourself. That's huh? right. Ah, uh, but I'm afraid Mr. Clements is in no position to help anyone. What do you mean? Listen. Garson here. Connect me with Mr. Clements' cell, please. Cell. You're connected, Mr. Garson. Clements? Clements, this is Garson. 
convinces you, Mr. Winston? You see, your friend Clements made the mistake of wandering into a restricted area, just as you did. Who's giving the orders? You or Professor Dean? Professor Dean is in the cell next to Clements. I should have known. You kidnapped him. Yes. The professor was not amenable to my plan. You see, Professor Dean not only made a robot that did not obey the first law, but in doing so, he found a way to nullify the first law in other robots. And has he told you how to do it? He can't have. Not if you've got him in a cell. He will. And then I'll nullify the first law in all robots. And as they're tuned to my voice, they will obey my orders. Oh, by the way, there's something that isn't in the file room. I don't have to manufacture robots in secret factories. Robots can reproduce themselves. It's very simple. Each robot will manufacture another. Double a penny 30 times, Mr. Winston, and you get over a million pennies. In no time at all, I'll have a huge army of indestructible machines. What's happened to you, Garson? No one in government service had a better record than you. You were the last man we thought would turn true. You don't know me very well, Mr. Winston. That's just about the biggest understatement I've ever heard. <laughs> and we thought Professor Dean was the security risk. The professor has an IQ of 195, yet he's a fool. By helping me, he could be the most powerful man in the world. I cannot understand men like him or you. Spoken like a true paranoiac. <laughs> Isn't it strange? You devise a perfect form of government, an infallible method of controlling the world, and you're called insane. Remember, Mr. Winston, robots are not susceptible to bribery. They can't be blackmailed or intimidated or flattered or fooled. Can you say the same about our politicians and government office holders? Can you... No, nope. uh, we're all fallible, and you're at least as fallible as the rest of it. No, and what makes you say that? Because you're wrong, your plan just won't work. Why not? Because your plan depends on Professor Dean. He's a dedicated scientist. He knows that if he alters the first law of robotics, whatever happens will be his responsibility. This is why he won't help you, no matter what you do to it. Ah, but he will help me for the simple reason that he is only human. Sooner or later, he'll weaken it's only a matter of time. You're fast running out of time, Mr. Nothing Garson. Nothing can stop me. Oh, maybe I can. Ah, <laughs> oh, what good is locking that door going to do? I'm going to kill you, Mr. Garson. No oh, gun, just like Clements. And you all run so true to form. Put it away. You leave me no alternative but to kill you. You think shooting me will stop my plan? Without you, the robots would have no leader. And they won't do anything to me for killing you because they'll obey the first law. Ah, oh, I see your reasoning. You think you'll get rid of me and then free the professor and Clement. No, Garson, don't move toward me. <laughs> what are you afraid of? You have a gun. Don't take another step. Or well, shoot, Mr. Winston. Shoot. All right. <laughs> you with every shot. Everyone. You. You must be. A robot? Yes. Yes, I am. You see, the real Garson is dead. I had my face made in his image. When you and Clements are dead, two robots will be made in your image. The same thing will ultimately happen to the professor. That's my real plan, Mr. Winston. Robots won't have to fight the army or anyone else. We'll just step into your shoes, each and every one of you. But you haven't found a way to nullify the first law yet. Not yet. Until you do, a robot can't kill. It must obey the first law. All but one robot, Mr. Winston. The one Professor Dean made just before he disappeared. The robot to which the first law of robotics does not apply. You. You. Yes. You. I... I am that robot, Mr. Winston. Don Harry and directed by Ted Bell. 
In the cast, Jay Barney, Bob Dryden, Jack Manning, Jack Grimes, and Owen Jordan. Audio engineer, Neil Pope. Sound technician, Ed Blaney. Script editor, Jack C. Wilson. Original music by Alexander Vlastotchenko. Orchestra under the direction of Glenn Osser. Executive producer for Theater 5, Edward A. Byron. We would appreciate your comment. Write to Theater 5, New York 23, New York. This is Fred Foy speaking. Please, please postpone this thing. Why? Give us a chance. No. I've got to warn the other adults. Your day is past. Give us a year. Give us six months. We take over the world within a week. If you don't like it, you can get off. Goodbye. Hello. Hello. Listen, everybody. Listen to me. Theater 5 presents Rebellion Next Week. You're going to find it very hard to believe what I have to tell you. But you've got to listen carefully. It's about little Mary Newhall, a high school student in the town of Tewkesbury. My name is Ethan Miller, and I teach English there. Mary is just a little girl with a C-plus to C-minus average. To give you an idea of what she's like. Gosh, Mr. Miller, you mean in only three weeks we've got to read a whole book and then think about it and then write a book report? Two whole pages. That Golly. is Mary Newhall. You'd never think that every adult in the civilized world is in danger from the activities of that little girl, now would you? Well, listen. That day when she stopped after class to ask me about the book report. Well, how short can the book be, Mr. Miller? I mean, can I report on The Man Without a Country? Oh, well, uh, that's a short story, Mary. You will report on a, a full-length book. Oh, well, all right then, Mr. Miller, but golly, all the teachers give us so much work. Uh, oh, Mary. Mary, did you leave this notebook here? Mary! Uh, oh, well. I wasn't sure the notebook I discovered belonged to Mary, so I looked in it. It was filled with names and addresses. Addresses in our country and Canada and Europe, Asia, and Africa. And that puzzled me, but it was Mary's notebook, all right. There on the front was a sticker saying, I love Paul. And in a teenage scrawl that I recognized, her name, Mary Newhall. I happened to live near the Newhall, so on the way home, I took the notebook to her house. Her father told me that she was in her study over the garage out back, so I went out there, climbed the stairs, and... When I got no answer, I tried the door. And then I realized that Mary hadn't heard me because she was in a room beyond the one that I was in. A room with a padlock on the door, but unlocked right now. And as I went toward it, well, I heard course, her Frank, talking. The logistics of the situation will necessitate further delay. Oh, no, Frank. The consensus amongst our enlistees here in America is that the revolution need be postponed only two or three days maximum. The hypothesis on which we intend to proceed. Oh. Hello, Mary. Frank, hold on a moment. There's an adult here. Stay at the phone. I'll call you back. Well, I'm sorry to interrupt your phone conversation, Mary. Oh, golly, Mr. Miller. You made me jump. You left your notebook at school. Gee, where's my notebook? Oh, gosh, thanks a million, Mr. Miller. There certainly are a lot of addresses in that notebook from all over the world, too. Oh, yes, they're, they're pen pals in the Beatles fan club all over the world. Mary. Yes, Mr. Miller? Mary, I heard you talking on that phone. Oh, gosh, that's embarrassing. It was very strange talk for a young girl. You mean all that stuff about revolution and everything? 
Oh, that was me and my friend Frank. It's a game we play over the telephone. No, Mary. I don't know what was happening when I came in here, but it wasn't a game. I heard words like logistics and hypothesis and oh, other... Oh, gosh, I don't even know what they mean. Frank and me, I mean, I, we learned all that stuff out of a book. Oh? And who is Frank? Oh, he's just a boy. You don't know him. He's younger than me. Uh, then I... <laughs> Mary. Yes, Mr. Miller? Why has the dial on that phone got only letters on it? Why hasn't it got any numbers? Oh, well, I... Or wires... Or any cord. Uh, Mr. Miller, you, you caught me. There isn't really any Frank. I, I just pretend over the toy telephone, that's all. Toy? Mary, I could hear Frank's voice, someone's voice, answering you on that phone. Yes, sir. Now, uh, I want the truth. About what, Mr. Miller? About you. About Frank and about that telephone. About this revolution you were just talking about. About that notebook, too. It's not just a, a list of pen pals. Now, is it, Mary? You want to know quite a lot. I certainly do. All right. How did that door close? I closed it. But you never moved. You just sat there and it closed behind me and... Let, let me see. What? Oh, it's quite impossible to open it, Mr. Miller, until I release it. Mary Newhall, just what's the meaning of all this? Well, that's what we're going to discuss. Oh, sit down, Mr. Miller. That's better. I assume that sometime while you were being somewhat skimpily educated at the university, Mr. Miller, that you learned something about the... Evolution of man. Can you be the same child to whom I've been giving C's? Oh, a child to whom you gave C's, Mr. Miller, is a noxious character that I created. A role I played, shall we say, so that I could get through the days and years until the rebellion could be launched. The rebellion. You did learn something about evolution in that rather ridiculous college you went to, didn't you? Yes, then you know, of course, that our species could not have survived had it not been that we met the needs for survival by developing ever upwards. Now, the Java man, our ancestor, could never have lasted had he stood still. I know all that, Mary. I'm surprised that you do, too, And but... we can't survive. Mankind, the way mankind is right now, can't survive unless we change. But you were talking on the phone about revolution. That's right. Suppose that you, with the brain that you possess had been born into a society of cavemen. Do you think they would have listened to you? I'm sure I can't tell you, but that's beside the point, Mary. I want to know I'll what... get to everything you want to know. Look at that window. What? what? How did you make that happen? You want to hear some music? We have no phonograph here, have we? And yet... Listen. Mm -hmm. Now, if you had been born into the age of the caveman, Mr. Miller, you would have been as far in advance of him as I am in advance of you. Do you want to turn the world over to me? Do you want me to govern you? I believe in self-government. Oh, well, that's the answer you would have gotten from the caveman. You would have had to revolt. So my friends and I are going to have to revolt. Your friends? Who... What are your friends? Mutants, Mr. Miller. Occasionally in heredity, there's a sudden variation in the norm. I'm a mutant, and there are several million mutants like me, all of us children, chronologically, but infinitely wiser than you grown-ups. Oh, if we leave the world to you, the world will perish so we're taking over. Mary, open that door. I want to get out of here. No, Mr. Miller. I'm afraid you're the first victim of our revolution. What are you going to do with me? Well, you'll find out in a minute. All right, never mind me. What are you going to do to the world? You say you're going to take it over. But what are you going to do with it? You may rest assured that we shall not do with it what you grown-ups have done. 
We shall not dress young men in soldier suits and give them weapons with which to kill each other. We shall not dig shelters in which people may crouch and cower while bombs drop on their cities. We shall not allow some to starve while others grow fat. All the systems that you adults have invented are childish to us. Oh, here's Helen. Why was the door shut, Mary? You knew I was coming. Why did you... Oh, Mr. Miller. Get out of the doorway, Helen. I'm getting out of here. Sorry, Mr. Miller. You're not leaving. Oh, gee whiz, Mr. Miller. I'm sure glad to see you because I was going to ask Mary about the homework. Do we have to Never do all mind. of Never mind, Helen. Well, what do you mean? Apparently, Helen, she means that you are a mutant, too. And you don't pretend any longer. Because I know your secret. That's quite true, Helen. In that case, we'll have to immobilize him, Mary. I know, but how? This, of course, is a test of our principled position. What principled position, for heaven's sake? Mm, I know. Have you talked to Frank about this? Not yet. I'll call him now. Frank? Mary here. No, the adult is still present. What's that? Oh, yes, immobilization, of course. The question is, which type of immobilization? Hmm. We can't let him out of this room. Oh, that was Helen, Frank. She's right, of course. If he got out of this room, we wouldn't have any power to... Uh -huh. Freezing, huh? Freezing? You think freezing fits in all right with our principled position? Uh-huh. Huh. It's a rather nice problem, but I think you're right. All right. Bye. We freeze him? We freeze him. And right away, Helen. <laughs> I listened intently to everything that was said during Mary's phone conversation with Frank. These children, far more brilliant than I could ever be, and far more powerful, intended to freeze me. But I didn't panic. I had noted that to call Frank, Mary had simply dialed F. And I'd also noted her saying that if I got out of this room, they would have no more power over me. I determined Mary, to get out I'm not as soon sure. as possible. Our principal position commits us to nonviolence. Frank feels that freezing is nonviolent. He may be making a distinction without a difference. But pragmatically, he's right. I wouldn't worry. It may be unpleasant, but it's nonviolent. You see, Mr. Miller, the whole point of our revolution is that we're sickened by the violence you adults have unleashed in the world. So you'll freeze me, whatever that means. But just because there are no ropes or chains, you'll tell yourselves that you're not being violent. Well, I am your victim, and I say it is violent. You have a certain point, but we're in no position to consider oh, it. Let's get on with the freezing. No, no, wait, wait. Well? Well, um, look, this, uh, this has all been a tremendous surprise to me. It's hard for me to take in. You can understand that, I'm sure, but... If you can convince me that you really have learned so much more than grown-ups, it might reconcile me to what you're going to do to me. If I were reconciled, it, it wouldn't really be violent. What do you want us to do? Well, before you came, Mary seemed to pluck music out of the atmosphere. Can you do that, too? Yes, Mr. Miller, I can. It's amazing. And somehow it helps me to understand. Can you do all of the things Mary can do? She just sat there and made that window open without touching it. I can do all of those things. See the window? Thank you! Oh, uh, stop! It's on the It was a two-story drop, and I was stunned for a moment just lying there. And then I heard those children coming after me. I scrambled to my feet, ran through the backyard, and climbed the fence as I kept going toward the center of town. I was headed toward the police station. I wanted those children... 
those, those, those monsters captured and locked up. I was pretty sure they could hurt me only in that room over the garage that I just escaped from. I wanted to maneuver them into a trap. And so I thought of an alley between the police station and the East End garage. They followed me as I ran into it and turned to face them. Come on, Helen. In here. I'm coming. Well, Mr. Miller, do you give up? I should think not. Come and get me. Uh, take him on the right, Mary. I'll take him on the left. Wait a minute, Helen. What can you be thinking of? Put that stick down. Oh, I'm sorry. I've compromised our principles. But the alternative is unthinkable. We can't jeopardize the revolution. We can't let the grown-ups continue their folly. Well, he can't move out of this alley without coming toward us. And if he does, I'll show you how to defeat him. Well, I am coming toward you, and we'll see who defeats whom. Chief, all right. Arrest him. Oh, Chief, I'm so glad you're here. Golly, I don't know what got into Mr. Miller. He went all funny and chased us into this alley. Yes. Well, gee, I'm awful glad we were near the police station. I was scared to death. Chief, don't listen to these children. Now, what is going on here? Gosh, I don't know, Chief. Mr. Miller started chasing us and yelling things we didn't understand. Oh, now, I can't believe that of Mr. Miller. We couldn't either. We didn't even run at first, did we, Mary? No, but when he started to grab Chief, us... will you please listen to me? Oh, he scares me the way he shouts. Now, shot. now, calm down. I... I'll listen to you, Ethan. Well, Chief, these children are planning to... They're planning to overthrow the government. Now, what kind of talk is that? Look, look, look at that pocketbook there. You see that notebook? Mary, give him your notebook. Well, what about it? Oh, it's my pen pal's notebook. Here, you can have it. Look at the names and addresses in that notebook, Chief. She says they're pen pals, but she doesn't write to them. She telephones. Oh, no, no. Wait a minute, Ethan. Here's one in Tibet. You want me to believe that she telephones him? Oh, look, Chief, believe it or not, these children are engaged in a conspiracy. Oh, gosh, Mr. Miller flipped his lid. Chief, I've been the school teacher in this town for seven years. Did I ever seem crazy to you before? No. All right, then. Just what am I accused of? Maybe he was molesting us. I read once where a teacher Shut up. ran it. Shut up, you. I, 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 I mean, this, this, this is a terrible misunderstanding. Now, now, Chief, I claim there's something very, very wrong with these two girls. Maybe my claims seem pretty strange to you. But if these two are innocent, they'd be willing to sit and wait for a while in the station house if you asked them to. Now, wouldn't they? Well, I should certainly hope they'd respect my back. All right, all right, then. Please, take them to the station house and let me go for half an hour. For what for? To gather evidence. To clear my name. All right, Ethan, all right. You kids willing to come to the station house with me? Oh, sure. Oh, if you go by my house, Mr. Miller, tell Mama I may be late for supper. <laughs> I hurried back to the room over the garage and I started searching. I knew I had to produce some evidence. But I couldn't find anything. I remembered what the children had said about the way we grown-ups had made a mess of the world. I, I remembered their policy of non-violence. And then I thought of the, of the world we live in. The dread of the bomb. Poverty. Slums and crime. Suspicion and fear among nations. And suddenly, I knew what I wanted to do. I picked up the phone... And I dialed F. Hello, Mary. What happened? This isn't Mary, Frank. This is the adult she told you about. Yes? I want to say to you, Frank, that I understand what you children are trying to do. Go on. And I agree that it is necessary. That makes you somewhat brighter than most of mankind. But I, I want to ask you one thing, Frank. Please. Please postpone your revolution. Why? Give us a chance. I'll warn the other adults. I'll preach to them on the street corners. No. I'll tell them that we've got to be neighbors and, and brothers to each other. Please give us a year. No. Give us six months, then. No. You adults had your chance. Your day has passed. We take over within a week, and there will be no postponement. 
but I... Please, Helena, listen, listen to me. Come back, Frank. Hello? Hello? Please answer. Please! It was a toy phone again, and there was no other evidence. No other evidence. I went back to the police station, told my story, and Chief Hobbs simply laughed at me. He called the superintendent of schools, and he told me to get out of town. That was yesterday. Last night, the school board met, and they fired me. I'm disgraced and out of my job now. But that doesn't matter. Listen to me. Listen to me, everybody. The rebellion is next week. We have less than a week to make this a decent world. Okay, come on, Ethan. Now move along. Listen to me. The rebellion is coming. Come on, Ethan. has presented Rebellion Next Week, written by Robert Senadella and directed by Warren Somerville. Script editor, Jack Wilson. In the cast, Bryna Rayburn, Evelyn Juster, Ivor Francis, and Bob Hastings. Audio engineer, Marty Folia. Sound technician, Ed Blaney. Original music by Alexander Vlasdotsenko. Orchestra under the direction of Glenn Osser. Executive producer for Theater 5, Edward A. Byron. We invite your comments. Write to Theater 5, Box 233, New York, New York. This is Fred Foy speaking. If you take one step across that roof, I'll jump. Yeah. That's what a few of those jerks down there in the street want you to do. Jump. Theater 5 presents Jump, Jump. standing there on the edge of the roof, the Hotel Phyllis roof. Must have been about ten feet away from me, I guess. Sandy-haired fellow in his late twenties, I figured. Kind of an Ivy League type. Slight. Dressed pretty good. I wouldn't have any trouble if I could get a hold on him, but uh, from the way he looked at my cop's uniform, I could see that I'd have to go very easy. He didn't trust me. He didn't trust anybody. Hey, uh, fella? Did you hear me? Hey, you up there on the edge of the roof. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. But not very well. I'd like to talk to you. Go ahead, talk. Well, I don't want to holler. Can I move up a bit, like, uh... Up to that vent pipe. Okay? All right. To the pipe, but no further. Hey, that's better. What's your name, mister? What difference does that make? Oh, it's red tape. I gotta make out a report. 
you know. Well, if it's easier for you, I'm Jonathan Weldon. Weldon, huh? Weldon. Jonathan Weldon? Yeah. Hey, don't I know that name like, uh, you're a writer or something? Or something. Oh, sure, sure, I know. I was reading about your father, Harry, uh, Harry Weldon in Sports Magazine. He's the guy that has the concessions, like, for uh, hot dogs, programs, stuff at all these stadiums in the ballparks. Yeah. And you're a book writer, huh? Well, I'm pleased to meet you. I'm uh, Charles Emery of the 17th Precinct. You can call me Chuck. Not for long. Oh, you don't want to say a thing like that, Mr. Weldon? That doesn't make sense. Here you are, a young guy. You're pretty healthy, huh? I suppose, Chuck. Now, your old man is loaded. You're doing what you want, high-class work. It's not like he was some poor slob who didn't know where his next meal was coming from. <laughs> Pal, you got everything. Yeah, from your point of view, not from mine. Something's bothering you. Chuck, huh? that is the understatement of the year. Well, uh, what's in here, Johnny? You got girl trouble? Is that it? Uh, look, officer, if I wanted advice, I'd have gone on the couch. The city of New York isn't paying you to give me free analysis or psychological counseling. Well, it could be. But I think you need it. Now, I'm only a cop, but uh, you give me a fair shake, maybe I can help you clear things up. How about it, huh? Chuck, you're a good cop, but... but it's a long but... way down to that sidewalk, mister. Once you step off, you can't change your mind. So you better be plenty sure you want to take that step. Right? Right. Right, you're right. Give me five minutes. Tell me what's bugging you. And maybe you'll feel different. Don't. Don't edge up on me like that. <laughs> don't flatter yourself. I got a wife and three kids, Johnny. I'm not going to wrestle with you on the edge of the roof. But I'll be glad to listen to you. All right. I'll tell you why I'm here. Because I don't want to live anymore. My whole world is just disintegrated. A dame, huh? That wasn't the first thing. It started with my last book, The Gingerbread Motel. Huh? <laughs> no, no one else ever heard of it either. Came out two months ago. The greatest reviews you ever saw. Well, what's wrong with that? Critics called it the season's greatest literary achievement. Sensitive, lyric, evocative. Oh, that's good. Yeah, oh, sure. So this morning, I went to see my publisher, David J. Bernstein. Johnny, look at these reviews. L.A., Dallas, Cleveland, Chicago. Every one of them raves. <laughs> that's quite a collection. Yeah, Dave, I know. I, I've seen most of them, so... Well, I don't understand why you don't advertise more. Well, advertising costs money, Johnny. Yeah, but with these reviews... Well, we... the critics like Gingerbread Motel, Johnny, but we're not getting a response to the warrant advertising. Yeah, but, but a good book. You know, you have to tell the public. It doesn't happen that way, Johnny. When a book sells, we advertise. When it doesn't, we can't afford to. Gingerbread Motel isn't selling. We'll be lucky if we get back your advance. Well, guess I've been counting chickens. See, with those reviews, Dave, I thought I had a bestseller, maybe even a movie sale. Forget it. Now, let's face it, Johnny, you're a great writer, but you're not a crowd pleaser. Now, if you could only learn to cater to the crowds, maybe you wouldn't be such a good writer, but you'd make a very good living. Chuck, that's the way this happy day started. Well, okay, Johnny, but just because you're not making a million bucks, well, lots of guys don't. They don't kill themselves. You probably make more than me, and I got a family. I know, but I need more. Just how much more, I didn't know until I met my girl for lunch. I see, Johnny. At least I think I do. Oh, so, Sylvia, that's the way, that's the way it seems to stand. And you're sure that Bernstein was right? Oh, Dave always tells me the hard facts. And they evidently are all hard. Oh, Sylvia, I know it's a disappointment. Disappointment? Johnny, I don't measure our engagement in years, but in books and broken promises. 
There have been three of each. Oh, darling, please. Let's not argue. Oh, no argument. But time is passing. Fast. Sylvia, I know it's not the way we planned, but we can get married today if you want. And live on what? Your rave reviews? <laughs> Johnny, I'm not ready for a Greenwich Village railroad flat. Gee, I thought you were glad I was a writer. Why, well, I am, Johnny. Well, these are just things that can happen to a writer. To you, Johnny. But not to me. I admit I like expensive things, living nicely. You have talent, Johnny, but it won't pay my bills. I see. But there is something you can't do. You have a father. Make your peace with him. Work in his business and write on the side. Oh, I doubt if Dad will That's do your it. only chance, Johnny. I'm going to be practical this time for both of us. She handed me back my ring, Chuck. Gave me till the next day to get squared away with my father. Otherwise, we were through. Here, dames. Well, Johnny, dames, like they say, are like trolley cars. You just wait for another. Not like Sylvia. Beautiful. Beautiful, Chuck. I'm sensitive and the only woman I ever wanted to marry. That's, well, that's why I swallowed my pride and went to my father's office. Yeah, that's the deal, Barney. I either get the merchandise at my price or you lose the contract. Call me tomorrow. <laughs> How's that for the old fist, Johnny, huh? A quarter cent off each hot dog. You know how much that means to me? Thousands. <laughs> well, Johnny, you're uh, quite a stranger. What can your old man do for you? Well, you uh, once promised me a job, and I need it now. Yeah, how come? Everybody tells me what a great success you are. Oh, I am. Gingerbread Motel got great reviews all over the country. Oh, come off it, Johnny. There's only one kind of success, the kind you can put in a bank. I told you that when you got out of college. Now, I still got a great business here, and it's yours if you'll knock yourself out working for it. That means seven days a week and some nights, the way I did when I built it up. You got a lot to learn. Crowd handling, commissary, accounting, buying. I, I just want a job. I, You see, I don't want to spend my life haggling over the price of frankfurters. I mean, I figured if I had a job, I could write evenings and weekends. Forget it. I could hire plenty of clock watchers, Johnny. I want to take charge. Dad, Dad. you don't understand. I want to get married, but well, I can't give up writing. Then write something that sells, boy. You know, I tell you the truth, Johnny. They tell me I should be proud of you. I'd like to. I try reading your books, but I never finished one. They bore me stupid. They got no guts, no excitement. Just like me, Johnny, you got to cater to the crowds or they'll starve you dead. I need help, Dad. I... Can I put it to you more plainly? Yeah, Johnny. Sure you need help. So you can't make terms. Especially with me. Nobody, but nobody dictates to Harry Weldon. Chuck, I walked around. I, I couldn't see any way out. That's why I came up here. I, I want to die. Still? What's the point of living? I have nothing. You got one thing, Johnny. Time. Give me one hour. One lousy hour. What's that? That's your public, Johnny. Yelling for your blood. There's quite a mob down there. Oh, don't pay any attention, Johnny. Give me an hour. Please. One hour. No more. I got Jonathan Weldon to give me his word not to jump off the roof of the Hotel Phyllis for one hour. I felt I'd won half the jackpot. I figured that all I had to do would be to get two other people to the Hotel Phyllis roof to talk to him. 
his father, Harry Weldon, and his girl, Sylvia Preston. I'm pleased to meet you, Mr. Weldon. Come on, this way. Your son's over here. This is a lousy thing for him to have done. I'd like to get my hands on it. Excuse me, Mr. Weldon, but if you're going to talk like that to Johnny, you might as well shove him off the roof personally. Now, you talk to him easy, like. And don't try to get too close. Thank you, officer. I'll try my best. Johnny? Johnny, your father's here. Oh? Stay there. Stay, Stay right there. Johnny. What do you want? I want to die. Oh, don't say that, son. I don't get it. Three hours ago, I asked you for a favor, and you practically told me to drop dead. I can't believe you care. Oh, of course I do, Johnny. I... Johnny, he's your father. Oh, maybe, but first he's Harry Weldon. Tough Harry Weldon, who can chisel a quarter of a cent off the wholesale price of hot dogs and force anybody, including his son, to do what he wants. Oh, maybe I was a little rough on you, Johnny, but that's only because I thought you ought to face up to the facts of life. I... If I hurt your feelings, I'm sorry. Uh, first, you kicked me in the teeth. And I then... said I was sorry. I... Look, if your mother was soft and kind of sensitive, I, I guess it ain't your fault that you took after her, not after me. But I loved her, Johnny. And aside from my own personal feelings, it's all wrong to throw away the life that she gave you. Now, look, there are hundreds of people downstairs in 45th Street, and you're making nothing but a fool of yourself up here. Some photographers took my picture when the police pulled me through the crowd, and we're going to be spread all over the newspapers tomorrow. Now, right now, you make up your mind and, and tell me what you want. I don't want anything from you. That's ridiculous, Johnny. You got me over a barrel. You can make any kind of a deal you want for yourself. Deal? Yeah, I'll give you $1,000 to walk away from that edge. For well, 5000 10000 Johnny. 25,000. Johnny, have a heart. All right, all right. 50,000. Think what it would mean to you. You could work in your books, get married if you want, or play around if you want. You wouldn't have to get up every morning and the rest of us slobs during the day, day's pay. All right, Johnny, 100,000 and a certified check. The officer here can act as a witness. <laughs> if I don't come across, you can sue me. <laughs> That's your closing bid. Johnny, that's quite a hunk of dough. I mean, it won't break me, but I'll miss it. But if, if you want more... All my life you tried to buy your way, and now you think you can buy my life. My life has never been for sale, and it's not for sale now. Uh, Johnny, Johnny, your father's only trying Get to... Get out of here. Get him out of here, Chuck. <laughs> I led Harry Weldon away, knowing that I had struck out. A couple of minutes later, Sylvia Breton arrived. I took one look at her and knew that she was a great reason for any guy to water the Officer, I'm Sylvia Breton. Where's Johnny? Over near the edge of the uh, roof there. Oh, poor Johnny. Officer, is it my fault? I mean, I, I didn't think he was so attached to me. Now, look, miss, it's a lot of things all rolled up together, but uh, maybe you can help him if you want to. Of course I want to. You just take it easy when you talk to him. Yes. Try to get him away from the edge of the roof. You got me? I, I'll, I'll try. Hello, Johnny. Johnny, aren't you going to look at me? That's better. Do you know why I came here, Johnny? Yes. Because the police brought you. Oh, Johnny, that's not nice. No, I suppose not. I came to tell you I was sorry about this afternoon. You know I love you. We wouldn't have been so close for five years. At lunch today, I, I was just trying to be practical. I could be a millstone around your neck, Johnny. I I'm not a thrifty housewife type. But if you think we ought to get married, Johnny, regardless of your financial condition, I'm quite willing. Willing? But not anxious? Oh, please, Johnny. If you love me, don't do this awful thing. I don't 
we'd feel guilty. My, my conscience would bother me till the day I died. Oh, it'd be just too terrible. Oh, please. Come here. Kiss me and put the ring back on my finger. Uh -huh. That would be a little too easy, Sylvia. Oh, then you don't love me. Not as much as I used to, perhaps, but enough to say goodbye. Johnny! Don't you see what that means, Sylvia? I'm giving you what you want most. I'm giving you a clear conscience. You're free. You're absolved of guilt. You can mourn me or not. Whatever makes the best impression on your friends, you've done your duty. I think you better go. Johnny, please! Please, don't! Hey, Johnny. I don't get it. Turning down a hundred grand and a beautiful girl like that? Johnny. Johnny, what do you want out of life anyways? You won't gain a thing by ending it all. You, you may wind up way ahead of the game. Okay, come on, Johnny. I'll buy you a drink. In the morning, you'll feel better. <laughs> I bet I would. Maybe well enough to start a new book. Oh, sure. Someday you'll hit your own jackpot in your own way, huh? How do I, how do I get out from here? Here, I'll give you a hand. Uh, no. Oh, but Johnny, didn't listen, you say... Listen to them. Oh, uh, who cares? What they say? I can't come down, Chuck. They want me. They want me to jump. The crowd, you hear what they say? Johnny, and... take my hand. Come on, come I on. Take my hand. Them, Chuck. I never cared about them before, and now I can't break away. Now, don't try to grab me. I'll take my hand, Johnny. Huh? In their hands, Chuck. When I came out here, I put myself in their hands, in their care. Get away from me, Chuck. Get away from me. And don't fight me, Chuck. Johnny, Johnny go! Oh, 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 oh. He asked for your help down there. You down there in the streets. And you wanted his blood. Well, you got it. Blood. On your hands. On your hands. Presented Jump, Jump, written by Raphael David Blau, directed by Ted Bell. In the cast, Jack Manning, Ralph Bell, Gene Gillespie, Ian Martin, and Sam Raskin. Audio engineers, Marty Folia and Bill Sandreuter. Sound technicians, Ed Blaney and M.C. Brock. Original music by Alexander Vlastotsenko. Orchestra under the direction of Glenn Osser. Executive producer for Theater 5, Edward A. Byron. We invite your comments. Write to Theater 5, Box 233, New York, New York. This is Fred Foy speaking.
presents... Hit and Run. Everything clear, Wallace? It's clear enough, Jim, but I don't like it much. <laughs> I don't either. Look, you're my lawyer, and I want you to keep your nose clean as much as you earn it. But you've got to take charge while I'm out of town. How serious is this trouble? Eh, nothing, really. In Glovestown, some of the numbers guys are dipping in the till. And the punk operating the gambling joints is out of line. I'm just going over there, and I'm going to get a couple of boys to rough up a couple of those. Now, I don't want to know what you're going to do. <laughs> nah, of course not, Counselor. I'll spare you the details. You just keep your eyes on things till I get back. Oh, uh, while I'm gone, there's one little thing, Walter. Oh? Okay, Allie, come on in. Hi. Right. Did you tell him, Jim? Now, wait. Jim, I thought we agreed I wouldn't have to see Allie again. Who do you think you are, you shyster mouthpiece? Shut up, Allie. One more word out of him and I'll slap him around like I did before. I said shut up. Now, it's for you, Waller. Remember this. Allie's still my kid brother, see? And while I'm away, you take care of him. Anything he wants. Anything he needs, understand? I just hope you try to cross me up, Walter. I'd like a reason to slug you I again. said shut up, Allie. Now, you got it straight, Walter. Now, you take care of the kid. Even if he kills somebody. <laughs> I'm in already. Yeah. You'll sit down. What's on your mind, Ellie? There's a cop named Ed Brannigan. I want you to get him transferred to the suburbs or something. Just like that, huh? Just like that. Why? To teach him a lesson, that's why. Just do it. That's all, Walter. Look, Allie. Your brother Jim's organization has a very nice, shall we say, working relationship with the police. They're sensitive about it. So we don't push them around any more than we have to. We leave them as much dignity as we can. Walter, I told you what to do when you do it. This cop, this Brannigan, brought me in on a drunken disorderly last night. He arrested you? You didn't call me? <laughs> I didn't have to. The desk sergeant knew who I was, and he fell all over himself apologizing. He didn't seem to be worrying about dignity. And don't you either, Walter. Slap it to that cop. You. <laughs> you don't dare say what you want to do, you, Walter. <laughs> Allie, Jim will be back in a few days. Why not wait till then? If he says all right, then... I want that cop transferred, and I want it done now. Look here, Allie, I'm a lawyer. Nuts, you're a mouthpiece, a shyster, a crooked shyster. Cut that out. Make me. Are you enjoying this? Making you sweat? If it weren't for Jim... Sure, I know, if it weren't for Jim. You've got to sit there and hate my guts, but remind yourself every minute that I'm Jim's kid brother and be respectful to me. What I remember is you stealing a car when you were barely in your teens. That's what you remember. Mm -hmm. That and a lot more of the same. Well, what I remember, Walter, is you got me off each time. You said yes, sir, and you saluted and you got me off, shyster. You little punk. That's what I was waiting to hear. That's all. <laughs> now get that cop transferred. You hear me? All right. All right, Alan. That's enough. Oh, and by the way, slip me a couple of hundred. I feel a big night coming on. Or can't you spare it? Two hundred? Sure. Sure, Alan. <laughs> Boy, I bet you'd love to see me hurt. But you never will. Because whatever happens, I'll always have you to get me out of any jam. Isn't that right, Counselor? Sure, Allie. <laughs> <laughs> How about a scotch, Mike? Oh, hi, Allie. I didn't see you come in. I've been over by the door about five minutes. Oh? 
No, uh, uh, hold that scotch a minute, Mike. Uh-huh. I've been over by the door and I've been studying. What do you think I was studying, Mike? Well, I, I couldn't say. I was studying little Miss Innocence there. Oh, that young girl? That's right. Pretty young stuff. Oh, yeah, I told her I couldn't serve her, Allie, but well, she wants to stay, so I give her lemonade. The little lady must want to be picked up. <laughs> yeah, some guys have tried, but I told them to leave her alone. Do you appreciate that? No. <laughs> she didn't really want lemonade, did she? Nah, she wants to feel big, Allie. She wants to feel important. I've been what you call uh, protecting her. You've been what you call saving her for me, Mike. Oh, no, no, Allie, you know, she's pretty young. Uh, what did you say, Mike? Nothing. Just remember who owns this bar. Well, I didn't mean nothing, Allie. Sure you didn't. I'll take that scotch now, Mike. I'll take it over there beside the little lady. Oh, sure, Allie. And I think the little lady, well, after a lemonade, a daiquiri. Nice and strong. Sure, Allie. Hello there, cutie pie. Oh. Hello. I got a surprise for you. Oh? I am a magician. Oh. Well, can you say anything but, oh? I don't know. All right, we'll find out. You see Mike, the bartender over there? Yes. Now, what would you think he's going to do? Oh, I don't know. Yes, I do. I can tell you. He's going to come over here and tell you to get away from me. Okay, that's what you say he'll do. Mm Mm-hmm. That's because that's what he's been doing all night, right? Yes. Well, what I say he'll do, I say he'll come over here and put down a scotch for me, and for you, he'll put down a daiquiri. Oh. And I'll say, that's all, Mike. The little lady and I want to be alone. And he'll say, sure. Oh. And he'll go down the other end of the bar. <laughs> I don't believe it. Here you are, Ali. Scotch and a daiquiri for the lady. Thanks, Mike. Now, Cutie Pie and I want to be alone. Oh, sure, Ali. Uh, just call when you need something, Ali. <laughs> well? How did you do it? I'm a magician. No, I mean, really, how? Don't ask questions. I just figured if the little lady wants to see life, the little lady ought to be allowed to see life without some bartender lousing her up. Well, <laughs> thanks. You got a name? I'm Anne DeVillo. Anything you need fixed? I don't know what you mean. Oh. Oh, this drink tastes strong. It's good for you. What I mean is that I'm a magician. And if there's anything you need, or maybe a family need, why, just say the word and I'll, uh, wave my magic wand. <laughs> well, well, if you could fix it up for my pop to earn a bigger hey, profit. What does your pop do? Well, he's got a little business. It's construction work. He takes subcontracts, if you know what that means. Well, I know. From big contractors with buildings to put up or like that, and he does the plastering part. And what's the name of his outfit? DeVillo and Son. The son part's my brother. The Villo and son. Mm-hmm. In need of subcontracts on construction for plastering work. It's as good as fixed. Oh, you sound as if you meant it. You'll see. Now, uh, how's about some plastering work right this minute? Mike? Yeah? Yeah, Two more. <laughs> too fast, Allie. You go this fast? Wait till we get near the airport around this next curve. Then I'll show you some speed. I'm scared. Slow down, please. The little lady says slow down. We'll slow down. Okay. (sighs) You're a cute little trick, you know that? Where you been all this time? Home. Mama wouldn't let you out? Oh, it's my father who wouldn't let me out. He's old-fashioned, my pop. Ah, uh, he'll get over it. What'd you do tonight, sneak out? Well, we had... We had a fight. He said he wouldn't let me go to the dance Saturday, so I... Oh, you came out and found me. Well, baby, it's a good thing. Except it's getting late. Ah, uh, so what? Well, I'm afraid of what he'll say when I get home. You just tell him he's gonna have all the subcontracts he can handle. That'll shut him up. Oh, you don't know my pop. (laughs) Watch. He'll be begging you to go out with me and stay all night so he can keep getting work. You make it sound as if... As if what, Kitty Pie? As if I was... 
selling myself. Well, don't you worry your head about it. You're going too fast again. Well, we got to get there fast. Where? The place I've got. Oh, please slow down. I slow down once, that's enough. Please. I can handle a car, kid. But I'm afraid. Watch. Watch me take this curve. We've got to go back and see if we can help him. Calm down. But, Allie, that man, he may still be alive. Not a chance, kid. He went through the air like a dummy. You've got to stop anyway. Not Allie Glazer, no, sir. But what kind of a man are you? You... Allie. Huh? Take me home, please. No. Please. Maybe you haven't noticed, baby, but the right headlight's out. For all I know, there's blood or clothing or something on the front of the car. They can stop me on account of the headlight, and then I'm stashing this car out of sight. All right. Don't take me home. Just let me off here. Not on your life. Sally! Please. You're a witness, baby. You stay with me. What are you going to do? Hide. But you can't hide forever. I can hide till 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. I can dump this whole problem in Walter Wayland's lap. Walter? Wayland, he's a lawyer. Allie? Well, what? Let me out, Allie. I won't tell anybody. I won't say anything, I swear. I'll just go home and... Shut up. But you can't hold me a prisoner. Can I? That's just what I'm going to do, kid. Hold you prisoner. You get used to that idea and shut up about it. <laughs> Till 10 tomorrow morning. But what are you going to do to me? Keep you right here. You like it? A little apart when I have when I got little ladies that want a part of their nose. You know, you could use a little makeup job yourself right now. I don't. There's nothing I want but just to get out of here. Look, you're starting to give me a pain. I knock it off. You hit that man and left him lying there on the street. Okay, you asked for it. You want any more of that? Please. I said you want any more of that? No. Please, no. Because I don't mind giving it to you. You behave and I won't hit you. I'll behave, Allie. I'll behave. I think you better know what you're up against. Do you know who I am? All I know is Allie. What about my last name? You didn't tell me. Oh, yes. When you were speeding away from the accident, I asked you to stop, and you said... You said not Allie Glazer. Glazer? Big Jim Glazer's brother. Oh. My brother owns this town. I know. You don't know everything. Not yet. Let me spell it out for you. At 10 o'clock, we're going to see Walter Wayland. He handles all my brother's legal affairs. He handles the fixes, too. And this is going to be a fix. But how can you fix it? Don't ask me. Walter Whalen will take care of all the details. But if he's a lawyer, I mean, it's one thing to maybe fix things, well, like political things, but but killing a man, hitting a man with a car and running away. That's enough. <laughs> And from now on, I hit you not once, but five, ten, fifteen times for every time you say I was driving any car that hit a man tonight. You understand? Yes. So, was I driving any car that hit any man? No, Allie. Well, that's better. Uh. Okay. Now, just to straighten you out, Walter Whalen will fix this because he has to fix it. Not just for money, but because that's what he's for. To fix things. You get that? All right. And I'm keeping you here, and later I'll take you to Walter's office because he may need you as a witness. To what? 
Well, the accident happened at 4th Street and Folsom Avenue. He might want you to swear I was miles away from 4th and Folsom. With you. But what if I didn't say that? What if your father's company never got another subcontract? Oh. Oh, you couldn't do that. Couldn't I? No. Every construction contract in this town goes through my brother. Now, you see what you're up against? Yes. On the other hand, my brother might be very grateful to the father of a girl that proved I was 15 miles away from 4th and Folsom. I see. So, what are you going to do? I guess I have no choice. I mean, for myself, it's one thing, but... But for my father... Now you're talking. I'll say you were with me and miles away. Fine. But don't get just one idea fixed in your head. Maybe that won't be what Walter Whalen wants you to say. What? Maybe he don't want you to say that you weren't with me. Maybe he wants you to say you were at 4th Street and Folsom Avenue when the accident happened and describe the car and give the license number. But how would that help you? I didn't say my license number. Maybe Walter will pick somebody who's been giving my brother a hard time. <laughs> Two birds with one stone. Oh, my God. What's the matter? Don't you know? Do you mean you really don't know what's the matter? You killed a man. Oh, go ahead and hit me. I don't care. You killed a man. It's bad enough to leave him lying there. Stop saying that. I don't care how much you hit me. I can understand wanting to get out of it yourself, but picking some other man and making me swear someone else did it, you... You're disgusting. You're through? Yes, I'm through. Fine. Because now I'm going... And I'm getting out of here. No, you don't. Yes, let me go. No, you oh, don't, no. baby. No. Please, no. Oh. Please leave me alone. <laughs> Don't do that. Where were you tonight? With you. Where? I don't know. Fifty miles away from Fourth and Balsam. If that's what Walter wants, that's where you were? Yes. Yes. Don't hurt me again. And if Walter wants you to say you were at Fourth and Folsom and saw the accident... I'll do anything you say. Anything Mr. Wyland said. Fine. Let's get comfortable till 10 o'clock. And we'll go see Walter. <laughs> Glazer and the young lady. Sit down. This is Anne DeVillo, Walter. Anne, tell Walter what you're ready to do. I'll, uh, I'll do anything you want me to, Mr. Whalen. I, but I don't like it and I don't want to. I don't know what this is all about, but I certainly don't want you to do anything against your will, Miss DeVillo. She wants to, all right. I imagine, Allie, that means you've arranged for her to fix something or other for you by swearing falsely. So what? Well, I'm not going to be a party to it. Whatever it is, Allie. And my advice to Mr. Villow is not to swear falsely to anything. Where do you get off of that stuff, Walter? Just remember my brother Jim will be back in town in a day or two. I guess you haven't heard, Allie. Jim's back already. What? Yes, he is. Now, Mr. Villow... You'd rather tell the truth than some falsehood, wouldn't you? Yes, Mr. Wayland. Well, you can start to do so in a moment. And I sincerely hope it will be very damaging to our friend Allie here. Walter, have you gone crazy? If Jim is back, all I gotta do is pick up that phone and talk to him and... Ah, but you can't do that, Allie. You see, Jim got back at 4 o'clock this morning. And he was killed by a hit-and-run driver at the corner of 4th and Folsom. (laughs) 